Good afternoon. I'm calling to order this public oversight roundtable hearing of the Committee on Health on the implementation of the District of Columbia Health Benefit Exchange Authority. I'm Council Member Yvette Alexander. I represent Ward 7 and I'm also the Chair of the Health Committee. I'm pleased to be joined by my fellow member on the committee at large, Council Member David Grosso. Uh, and we are here on Thursday, February the 28th on the first floor, room 120 of the John A. Wilson Building. As we all know, the Council established the Health Benefit Exchange Authority to implement the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act last year to further strengthen consumer protections for the uninsured and the underinsured in the district and to give persons access to affordable, comprehensive health care coverage. The Board is in the process of finalizing numerous policy decisions that will determine how the exchange will run. The Committee on Health is holding these monthly public oversight roundtable sessions to oversee and discuss these implementation efforts until the exchange is fully operational on January the 4th, January the 1st, I'm sorry, 2014. Last month we heard from the Health Benefit Exchange Authority's Executive Director, Mila Kaufman, and its Chair, Dr. Mohammed Akhtar. Both gave testimony regarding the Board's plans to implement the Health Benefit Exchange. We also heard testimony from a variety of stakeholders, including employers, brokers, carriers, and other groups that will be affected by the exchange. I have many questions regarding the Board's policy decisions and its engagement of stakeholders and the community in reaching these decisions. Although a number of questions were left unanswered, I was assured that stakeholder working groups comprised of community leaders and industry experts are steadily working to come up with policy recommendations that will become the framework for the market reforms, community outreach, and the composition of the plans and the benefits that will ultimately hold up the exchange. I'm anxious to hear from the groups about the progress um, of the work that they've completed up to date. Their progress is essential to meeting all implementation deadlines and maintaining our status as an independent exchange. At last month's roundtable, other concerns regarding the implementation of the exchange's brand new information technology framework, the DC access system, were raised. And we discussed plans for greater accountability of the companies involved in implementing the system. Representatives from the Department of Human Services and the Office of Contracts and Procurement are here to update us on the progress of the system's implementation and efforts to obtain security from the vendor and for the system's uh, performance. I know that many groups are still concerned about the possibility of eliminating the private insurance marketplace and the board's other market reform initiatives. We heard from a large we heard from a large amount of testimony about this at the last hearing and I want to continue an ongoing public discussion about it. Any potential changes to our current marketplace need to be examined very carefully before any affirmative action is taken. The board has assured us that it's working with stakeholders to come up with an agreeable solution uh, that we will have its final and we'll have their final recommendations by March, which is tomorrow. <laughs> I am, <laughs> I'll say at least by the end of March, okay? I am looking forward to continuing the discussion about these issues today. I'm ready to proceed with testimony from our public witnesses, but before that time, I would like to uh, allow my colleague, Councilmember Grasso, an opening statement. Councilmember Grasso. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Alexander. Uh, you know, these um, regular hearing, roundtable hearings, oversight is exactly what our role is in the Council of doing government oversight, and I'm really glad that you're doing it. Uh, Especially on such an important, maybe it's my phone. I think, or push it back. Something. Come on, Matt. 
So, it's, you know, especially in important issues like this, you know, um, we all know that this is going to have a huge impact, and you can tell by the packed room here in 120 today that this is one of the most important things that we have going for us in our city, how we deliver health care, how we pay for health care, and, and really um, what it's going to mean to the future of everybody, from our individuals who uh, need the government assistance to our businesses that operate here. So um, I'm, you know, very, very interested in seeing where we are every single month. Uh, if I could get an update every day, I would do it um, because I think it's vital. I know we're still shooting uh, for uh, your birthday, uh, I believe, uh, Chairman, uh, October 1st. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, uh, something that gives us all a really, I think, important target. Um, you know, we spoke, as you mentioned, about um, the IT infrastructure and how important it is to make that right. Um, we talked about the inside-outside market issue, um, but we also talked a lot about marketing. So I'll be looking to hear an update on the marketing effort and where we're going with that. You know, uh, you're not going to be successful if people don't know about it and if they get there, if it's uh, not a good experience. So um, I'm looking forward to the testimony. I will be a little bit in and out today. I have three hearings and I'm trying to go to them all. but. Um, my staff, Dion, will be here covering uh, for most of the time, and, and um, I'll be back uh, in for questions as well. Uh, one last point, you know, getting the public engaged is really what this is all about as well. So uh, thank you all for coming and testifying. Thank you for being here, taking the time. This may seem like a headache to come down every month and talk about this, but in reality it's an opportunity to come in and inform us and make sure that we're doing our job. So thank you very much, Chairwoman. Thank you, Council Member. And I'll call up the first panel of witnesses, uh, Mr. Scott Melville, Chief Executive Officer, Consumer Health Care Products Association, Kevin Reggie, Founder and President, Pulse Issues and Advocacy, LLC, and Ms. Barbara Lang, the President and CEO of the D.C. Chamber of Commerce. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. And Mr. Melville, you may proceed with your testimony. Well, thank you, uh, Chairperson Alexander and Council Member Grasso, uh, for the opportunity to provide some input on this important public hearing and this important public matter about implementation of the DC Healthcare Exchange. Uh, I am Scott Melville. I'm President and CEO of the Consumer Healthcare Products Association. Uh, we are a 501c6 trade association based here in the district at 19th and I, and we've, uh, we've called the district our home for over 75 years. Uh, by regulatory definitions, we are a small business, uh, but we employ 36 people in the district, and to them, we're a big business. Uh, we provide health insurance to all of our employees, uh, and they share in the cost of providing it. Uh, it's our second most expensive employee benefit, and we work hard to keep it affordable. Uh, which brings me to my first point. The small group market for businesses like ours in the district is working well and full of robust competition and choice. Uh, we work with our insurance broker to shop the private market for small group coverage that meets our needs. Uh, in the last four years, we've switched three times to get a policy uh, that is affordable and, again, that meets our members' needs. Uh, and it has worked very well in our situation. Uh, which brings me to my second point, uh, the issue of cost. Uh, we're shopping around because we're trying to get the best deal for our employees and for our members who pay for this benefit. Uh, any changes or policies and regulations that raise our costs of doing business in the district makes Virginia and Maryland more attractive to us. As I mentioned earlier, we've been in the district for over 75 years and we want to stay here. But we don't have to. The allure of lower rents or shorter commutes has always made Virginia and Maryland an attractive option. But for us, the balance has always tipped in favor of being in the district. However, if our second most expensive employee benefit is taken out of our control and we are mandated to participate in a closed system, the balance may no longer be so clear. Neither Maryland nor Virginia are considering placing similar mandates on small business. In fact, to the best of our knowledge, only the district and Vermont are considering this closed system approach. If you choose to move forward with a closed system and require small businesses like ours to purchase insurance exclusively through the exchange, I've been told that we could expect higher costs of providing our insurance to our employees and fewer choices. 
And as a result, as a small business, we have to look at options. We could stand pat and pay higher costs for health insurance if the closed system mandate on small business goes through. Uh, we could drop our employee health insurance, and our employees would be free to purchase health insurance on their own through their state exchanges where they live. Eighty percent of our employees live outside of the district, so they'd be purchasing their insurance through Virginia or Maryland exchanges, and the district would lose the benefit of their participation in the D.C. insurance market. And ironically, because we are a small business under 50 employees, the ACA would not penalize us for dropping insurance. Now, it's certainly not an option we would ever uh, take lightly, and we don't want to do, but it is an option. The third option would be we could relocate our offices to Virginia or Maryland. In addition to lower rents or shorter commutes for some of us, uh, we would maintain choice in our second most expensive employee benefit option. Um, we're at the uh, eight and a half years into a 10-year lease for our offices here in Washington, D.C. We've recently retained a real estate broker to help us shop the market for our new offices, and we're going to be making a 10-year commitment very shortly. Uh, we initially uh, limited our search to the District of Columbia, but when we heard about this proposed mandate, uh, we informed our real estate broker to keep Virginia and Maryland in play as well. We have a fiduciary obligation to explore all options. So in summary, I'm here to share the perspective of a small business that would be significantly impacted if the exchange proposal moves forward as proposed by the uh, exchange. And my message is simple. The current small group marketplace is working well for companies like ours. In implementing the health exchange, we would uh, encourage you to not impose a mandate on small business to participate in a closed system, but rather make it voluntary. If you choose to participate with a closed market and a small business is mandated to participate, you'll likely raise the cost of doing business in the district and make Virginia and Maryland even more competitive for businesses like ours. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and you had the pleasure of not being timed for your testimony. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. we're, we're going to have three minutes. These are experts, so they know, thank you. <laughs> they know the routine. I thought that was coming. Yes. Well, we're going to have more time. <laughs> <laughs> but you all may proceed with your testimony, Mr. Reggie. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, as you know, I represent NAFA in Greater Washington. The Greater Washington Association of Health Writers, uh, Health Underwriters, two um, uh, health insurance agent and broker organizations in the metropolitan area. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the issue of planned choice, both within the exchange, as is currently contemplated, um, and outside the exchange. Um, the um, a working group, an important working group called the Plan Offerings and Benefits Standard Working Group, which is one of the working groups formed uh, to do make recommendations to the exchange board. Um, a majority of that group has recommended that about 12 plans per carrier would be appropriate on the exchange. Now, that's subject to consideration by the board itself. But I want to just put this in context in terms of that 12 plans per carrier. Because it seems like a lot of choice once you uh, throw four or five carriers in the mix. But when we compare it to what's available in the current market, you're going to see that it's actually not, uh, would not constitute robust choice. Uh, one carrier, uh, Care First, in the current market has the following plan options by plan um, uh, choice, uh, by, by plan option. Um, Care First offers currently in the small business market 17 HMOs. 24 point-of-service plans, which is an HMO, HMO with an out-of-network option, 13 uh, PPOs, and 19 high-deductible plans. That's 73 plans compared to potentially something in the range of 12 that would be offered on the exchange. Now, the reason why this is important is, first of all, I don't think it's necessarily uh, an inappropriate decision to limit choices on the exchange. In fact, the Wakely Consulting Group um, that's done some analysis for this in a draft fashion for the exchange has suggested that there are some behavioral and organizational reasons why you want to limit choice on the exchange. The point that I wanted to reinforce here is that 73 plan option for a particular carrier versus 12 on the exchange reinforces the notion that we want to preserve a broader range of choices in the outside market. So those businesses that choose to, to select from a broader range of health plan choices, particularly in an environment where we're going to probably see rising premium expenses, that option should be preserved for small businesses uh, in the district. Thank you for allowing me to uh, present testimony this morning.
and I stayed well within your three minute <laughs> limit, uh, yes, Madam Chairwoman. So thank you. Very good. Thank you. And good afternoon, Mrs. Lyon. You may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and other members of the uh, of the council. And I've got eight pages here, so I'll have to try to summarize here to get within the three minutes. I am Barbara Lang, and I'm President and CEO of the District of Columbia Chamber of Commerce. I'm here to represent the 1,700 members of the chamber, the hundreds of thousands of employees they employ, and thousands of health insurance policies they currently have for their employees. Uh, we represent businesses large and small and truly work hard to make living, working, playing, and of course doing business a real good pop proposition for all of our residents. It is in that vein that I appear before you today. We are actively uh, involved in supporting the successful implementation of the health care exchange. Unfortunately, while many advocates, including the Chamber, are volunteering numerous hours to planning and policy working groups, the rushed pace of the exchange implementation is troubling to us and causes concern that we will not be successful right out of the gate. The district residents and businesses are being asked to place tremendous faith in the exchange without much evidentiary support that the exchange will be ready. We applaud you, Councilmember Alexander, for opening up the discussions on how this implementation is working. And I've got a few general comments, some of which you've heard uh, last month uh, around the slow pace of, uh, of the implementation. Uh, we still have some reservations that a workable exchange that can be created with only a few months left. Uh, and we think that it would surely help the process if there were less rigid requirements on, the, on so many businesses to join the exchange at, at startup time. It's important to note that we appreciate the tremendous pressure that the exchange staff is under to get this up and running by October 1. And know that they've just added five new staff recently, and we think that's a good thing. And we certainly applaud Director Kaufman for convening numerous advisory groups to move forward. But let me, I'm going to kind of shift because I'm seeing the clock is, is, uh, is running here. First, uh, under the essential health uh, benefit, we understand the board is, is uh, working to finalize the mandatory uh, minimum health insurance plan that can be offered, known as the EB EHB. Um, and that it, we're concerned that there are going to be some costs that are going to go up uh, and imposed on particularly small businesses on January 1. We are concerned about the add-ons uh, over and above the federal requirements that are being here. On small business education, we think it is crucial, and I think Council Member Grosso, you mentioned that early in your opening statements. We've got to talk to uh, um, our, our residents, but our businesses. Most of them are small businesses that have under four employees. They don't have an HR person uh, that can understand all of this, and so there's a real difference in a small business that has under 10 employees and one that has 49 employees that may be a little bit more sophisticated in how they they uh, they move forward so we think the working groups need to really look at how we roll this out and how we we certainly brand the exchange um, the um, uh, Transition phase recommendation, and I think there's been, we're delighted that there is a transition recommendation, but there seems to be some uh, difference as to whether the plan renewal starts on January 1, then you have the full two years, or if you renew later, uh, then it's less than two years. We think that's a problem. We think if we're going to have to do this, then people need the full two years. But I want to be very clear that it is always the Chamber's position that a close market is not in the best interest of the small business employer and and I can't be more uh, emphatic uh, about that and so I will um, you know there are lots of things that you'll see in my written testimony for the record and maybe in the Q&A session other things will come out as I said I have seven pages here and there's not time to read all of that so I'll stop now and wait for the Q&A piece thank you madam chair Thank you all for your testimony. Before um, we entertain questions, we've also been joined by another member of the Health Committee, at-large council member, Anita Bonds. And I would like to recognize her for opening statement. Thank you.
very much, um, Chairman Alexander. Um, I'm happy to be here this morning because I'm particularly interested in how we are going to implement the exchange uh, given the sense of, of so much unreadiness that I've heard from the um, persons in the business community and also from individuals in the um, broader residential community. So I'm very, very curious about this. I understand that our neighboring jurisdictions, both Maryland and Virginia, plan to offer their exchanges alongside the existing private insurance market as does most of the country. Um, in Vermont, that is the one um, jurisdiction that is contemplating a closed exchange that I know of today. And I thought that one of the things we needed to do is to have a healthy discussion about why the District of Columbia is recommending that we move in the direction of one exchange. So I thought that would be something that perhaps we can examine today in our discussions. So I look forward to comments on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your um, opening statements. And we will have rounds of five minute um, rounds of questions, if that's okay. I wanted to make a um, comment because both, well, all of you are mentioning about the closed market. Uh, being an obstacle maybe for a mandate um, with regards to the exchange. I wanted to just ask you, um, Mr. Melville, for your organization, how many employees um, do you have? We have 36 employees. 36. It's interesting, mm -hmm. and I ask that because what I'm finding when I'm talking to businesses, small businesses, those who have maybe um, 20, 15 to 20 mm -hmm. uh, employees are saying that's a good thing for them, mm -hmm. but those that have more, um, considerably more, like 50, you know, 35, mm -hmm. 40, 50, are saying they don't want the mandate. So I think it has to do a lot with maybe giving the, um, I guess, giving the option that mm -hmm. some will opt in and some will opt out. Um, that's what I'm hearing versus a mandate. I guess I don't really have a question. Well, one question is if, I guess with regards to the closed market, if you knew you could get a similar plan uh, through the exchange as you would in the open market, would that make you, um, I guess, more amenable to having a closed market? And that's for any of you, if you, if you knew you could get a similar plan. Uh, well, in the exchange as that, that you have now. Well, I, I would just add from my perspective as, uh, as, as someone who's been uh, choosing health care plans and trying to balance the budget of a company, um, health care is our second largest expenditure employee benefit and um, we try as much as we can to control the cost of that. Um, we realize health care is unpredictable. Um, and I don't think anyone has certainly what the future is going to look like, either a closed or an open market. Um, but at under the current system, we have choices. We can be mobile. We can choose from 70 plans. We have options. The more you close it, the less options we have, the more uncertainty there is, and the more concerning that becomes for us. Yeah. And I, I, I would say the same thing. And, I, and I'll use the, not even referring to my membership right now, but I use the chamber. I'm a small business as well. I have 20 uh, employees at the chamber. Uh, I currently have a plan that my staff loves, that we love, that is affordable for us. And we pay about 90 to 95 percent of that the chamber does. And so the employee does not pay an awful lot. Um, if, but we've got this set up that way. It's affordable. It's within my budget. The unknown, uh, I want the ability to be able to shop around. If my current plan gets uh, where it's not affordable anymore, I want the ability to go look and shop amongst the other plans and see what's right for the budget we have and for the employee population that I have. And I think the closed mar market will limit our ability to be able to do that. Well, Mr. Reggie, you mentioned 12 options well, per company? Yeah, no, I just want to underscore that this is a work in prog progress at the exchange, but their working group, the majority of that working group, recommended four per tier in the exchange. That would be a total of 12 plan offerings per carrier. So if and that's I was, the case, then that would be something for everyone, if that would be ideally. Wouldn't you agree? 
Well, I, th I think what uh, the point I'm, I, I want to underscore the, this afternoon is that that's, those are 12 plans, and for folks who want and like one of those plans, they should be able to select one of those plans within the exchange. But there are multiples more plans available in the 2 to 50 employee market currently. I counted 72 for one carrier. Um, I outlined those earlier. Um, so you add up those carriers, you're going to have a lot more choice, we believe, in the outside market. And let me just speak to another issue. In addition to plan choice, there's this whole question of employer versus employee contribution to premiums. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a lot of creativity and flexibility for employers to design the plans with carriers so that, for example, your lower income employees could pay far less in terms of their premium contribution, which helps them out because many of those folks can't afford to make large percentage contributions to their premiums. I'm advised that based on the administrative uh, mechanisms that are being established by the exchange, it's going to be exceedingly difficult, if not impossible, to continue to allow employers and their employers that kind of flexibility. This is an issue where a low-income employee is going to uh, be disadvantaged if they only have the option of pursuing coverage through the exchange, which already has, will already will have, I believe, a lower number of plans to select from. Again, not necessarily a bad idea based on the philosophical approach we're, um, that many states are pursuing with the exchange of simplifying and standardizing choices, provided there's another set of broader policy options that are available outside the exchange. So my last question is for any of you that want to answer. So what would be an adequate transition period? Say if we kept the market open to see how the exchange was working with that, what would be the um, adequate transition period or the adequate period to, you know, see how things are working? One year? I two think, years? Six months? I, I think we, in, in, in my testimony, we are saying two years. Would be would be a, a great way to allow people to transition if we're going to go to the closed market. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you all, and Councilmember Grasso. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for coming down and testifying. I think one thing I'd like to do is just put a little bit on the record about what the what the you, I think you went into a little bit, Ms. Lang, about the difference between a small business, medium business, and a large business, mm -hmm. and the impact that this type of kind of action has. Uh, and not so much even just the closing of the market on the outside, but really just the change in the entire uh, environment around purchasing coverage and you know obtaining coverage and then going out and do it. Can you just talk a little bit about that? You mentioned you know maybe a four-person employee. You know, just can you expound on that? Well, yeah. What, what what I was saying is you know what we're talking about is uh, uh, firms that have um, you know one to fifty um, uh, employees. Uh, a small firm, and, and let's face it, most of what is in the District of Columbia are small businesses. Uh, you've got a lot of large, a few large businesses, but the bulk of my, 70 percent of my 1,700 membership are small businesses. And so, when you talk about a four-person firm, you know, a, a principal and three or four employees, they are likely not going to have an HR. Well, they will not have an HR specialist on staff. And so, it is the it is the principal and maybe the executive assistant that is trying to manage this process. When you get to a firm that's above 35, 40 employees, they probably have somebody that at least manages that process. And, and the point I was making in the education piece, I think the exchange has got to recognize every small business is not equal. And, and you've got to be able to craft the education, the messaging, the branding uh, for that person, that know, that little firm that knows nothing to somebody else that's more sophisticated and they're all small businesses. That's right. I, yeah. I agree with you. Can you guys also expound a little bit on, um, and it, it's probably Kevin more than the others, the, the, I mean Mr. Regan more than the others, but the, you know, the, the reality is that um, these working groups are a repetition. We had working groups already last year that talked about some of these issues. We have new working groups, and I'm glad that we have them. But uh, where are they? Are they happening? Are they not happening? Um, what are the deadlines on them? What are we trying to decide in them? And how often do they meet? Just, uh, I'd like to hear from folks that are engaged in them. 
Sure. Well, I certainly defer to uh, Ms. Kaufman uh, and exchange staff, uh, and they can provide you with more details. But it's my understanding, and uh, my client, uh, the agents and brokers, have been working very closely uh, with these working groups. Mm -hmm. um, there have been um, there's been an enormous amount of work done by those groups. We applaud uh, Ms. Kaufman uh, and uh, the board uh, that she reports to, the Health the Benefit Exchange Board, for establishing um, a more stakeholder-driven process mm -hmm. for decision making. Yeah, there are recommendations there. Th many of them are, are finished with their work. Yeah. A number of them are ongoing. Some will be starting next month. And so it's a roving process where there's concentrated focus on specific issues, um, and there's been a broad range of, of stakeholders in those groups. Okay. And so the recommendations then are given to the board out of these groups or just for Ms. Kaufman? What are, do you, what's your understanding of where the recommendations are? Well, the, as I, and again, I, I defer to, um, uh, to, to, to Mila and, and uh, the staff people, but um, the notion is that if there's consensus reached by those stakeholders, those consensus recommendations will be taken to the board. If there's not consensus and there's some you know, uh, issues have arisen around what constitutes consensus, but if there's not, um, that information can be taken to the board, um, but the recommendations there hold less weight than um, if a consensus is reached by those stakeholder yeah. groups. The reason I ask these questions, you know, Mr. Chairwoman Alexander, is because, you know, I've been in a lot of these meetings, you know, I've been in a lot of the working groups in my past, uh, I've actually ran some of them in my past time as a staff member here. I find them extremely useful and you know very helpful to have everybody in the room and hash them out, uh, hash out the issues. It does take a while to do that. And if you commit to you know a unanimous decision or you know you know whatever it is you want to commit to, it's hard to get to that. Um, and so with October one looming in my mind uh, sooner than not, I'm just curious about the process and I'm I'm sure Ms. Coffin will, will talk about it a lot today but you know for me again you know I raised this issue last time we were you know b you know in this hearing I'm worried about getting to the to the end game here I'm worried about um, setting up something that is usable and friendly and you know everyone can get in there and get what they need um, so this is if this is part of it I applaud that effort and I think it's important but we also have to just get on the horse and move forward um, let me just add one thing because I agree with you and, and one of the things I said in my testimony, we are, I think that the exchange uh, is doing a great job but they have an, an enormous task ahead of them to get this done uh, and, and ready to go by October 1 and, and that's why I put in that we need to really look at as to whether we are putting in more um, requirements in the plans, we're adding on things that may be over and above what the federal requirements are and, and can we stay with the base of what the feds require and move through this because we're running out of time to get all of this done. That's right and so am I but I would like to make one more little statement on that point I think it's really valuable. The more that you ask the plans to do regardless of who it is whether it's uh, DISB or the exchange or mm -hmm. uh, the legislature we we have uh, to recognize that it takes a long time for these entities to come up to speed mm -hmm. whether uh, it's the uh, carriers themselves or the businesses that are trying to provide uh, care for their people and so um, that's just something to factor in to the October 1 deadline is that this is all part of the process so thank you very much for coming down and I look forward to hearing from you all again next month uh, you know, <laughs> again, where we are in this process. Thank you, Council Member Bonds. Thank you very much, um, Chairwoman. I, I just want to continue this discussion about the products of the advisory committee. Uh, one of the concerns I have um, from what you have said is that the diversity of size of companies is very significant in planning how the exchange will work. And I was just wondering, have there been discussions in the advisory committees that take into account, you know, the size there, as um, Ms. Lane said, there are many companies that are four people or less and fewer that are 50 or more? <coughs> I have not personally been in, in the advisory. I have a lot of staff. I'm spreading them out as much as I can to go to the advisory uh, meetings. So I personally can't say whether that is being discussed sure. yet or not. 
Well, Council Member Lawrence, can I can I speak to this? The, you know, just to reinforce the point that Ms. Lang made, which is. Um, you know, different size employer groups have different needs, and they have different uh, level ranges of resources available to them. One of the um, uh, size groups that has not received a lot of attention in connection with exchange implementation, which I think deserves more, is the 51 to 100 size group, because those employers in two years after 2014 will also have the option of moving into the exchange. That's under federal law. The concern we have, again, in terms of exchange implementation and uh, um, the limitations perhaps on the variety of choices that will be available, these are typically groups, 51-100, that are able to sit down and tailor their coverage more specifically to their businesses, their employees, and their families' needs. If you force those folks into the exchange, again, beginning in 2016, you're going to further, you're going to really limit their choices because they have an even broader range of choices typically in the current marketplace than do the 2 to 50. But for, I think, all of these groups, um, we want them to be able to have um, uh, a, a good experience on the exchange if they choose to purchase their coverage on the exchange. But for those who are looking for more uh, uh, plans that are more specifically tailored to their own unique needs, we, we are urging um, uh, the administration and the council to keep that option open. Okay. For all those groups, two employees to 100. Okay, all right, thanks very much. I'm done. Oh. Yeah, I wanted to find out about that. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to call up our next panel, Dave Johnson, Council of Insurance Agents and Brokers, Edward Bonifant, <coughs> Executive Vice President, Howard W. Phillips and Company, Dave Chandra, Senior Policy Analyst, um, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Good afternoon, gentlemen, and if we don't have any of your um, testimony, please provide us with a written copy um, after today if you can. Thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, go right ahead. You may proceed. Thank you, Chairwoman Alexander and members of the Council. My name is David Johnson. I'm a Senior Vice President with RCMND, a national insurance and employee benefits brokerage firm that helps large and small employers develop competitive health benefit packages that help each client achieve their respective coverage, cost, and risk management goals. I'm testifying today on behalf of our Washington Trade Association, the Council of Insurance Agents and Brokers. The Council is headquartered in Washington, D.C., and serves as the premier association for top regional national and international commercial insurance and employee benefits intermediaries worldwide and is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. It has been, the council has been headquartered in Washington for nearly 20 years. I'm testifying today to express the council's concerns over two issues regarding the city's implementation of the district's health benefits exchange. The first issue concerns the future of employer benefits and available plan options for small groups. The second issue is the future role of benefits brokers and the access employers may or may not have to experienced risk management professionals that many do rely on today. The council as an employer has long offered its employees a competitive health insurance package designed to attract and retain talented staff. Being a small company with approximately 30 full-time employees, the council <laughs> offers generous and comprehensive health insurance benefits that aim to cover nearly all of our employees' cost. The benefits are critical to competing with profitable, large employers when it comes to attracting the level of qualified talent that we employ. The Council is therefore focused on ensuring that these kinds of highly competitive plans continue to be offered as the District seeks to implement the exchange. 
We understand that Director Kaufman is working aggressively to include as many carriers and as many plan options on the exchange as possible. And the Council appreciates her efforts to minimize the market disruption. The Exchange Authority must leverage its efforts to ensure that it offers various plans that are both comprehensive and broadly address the whole market, not just one aspect. The Council will continue to offer its employees a competitive benefits package and is hopeful that we can continue to do that through the Exchange. To that end, we support building a transition period for the Exchange that is methodical and focused. The transition would allow small groups to review their options and allow the exchange to ensure it has products available to keep Washington businesses, like ours, competitive. If employers in Maryland and Virginia are able to offer stronger, more competitive benefits packages, then the exchange puts the council as a Washington employer at a comp competitive disadvantage. The second issue I would like to just quickly touch on is um, for the committee uh, is the, the consumer access to broker services as consumers purchase and interact with the insurance exchange. Um, small employers in the district have for decades relied on professional insurance brokers to help them design insurance plans, uh, provide strong benefit packages, and keep costs down. These functions include HR act, human resources activities like educating employees on plan options, creating cost-saving wellness plans, assisting enrollment, assistance with claims issues, and basic claims administration functions. It is critical that small employers continue to have access to experienced brokers that understand their individual needs. Without strong broker participation in the DC Exchange, many small businesses will simply choose to avoid this arena and the likelihood of significant market disruption is high. So we are very appreciative to Director Kaufman's support for broker services on the exchange as she has detailed in her vision to us. We look forward to being a continuing uh, participant in the exchange stakeholder working groups and uh, working to build a service that pre preserves the options available in the private market and preserves consumer access to insurance professionals. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And next we'll hear from Mr. Bonifaz. Uh, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't intend to uh, use the full three minutes simply because I had no voice yesterday. Uh, so I'll uh, use my voice as best I can over a short period of time. Um, I'm Ed Bonifant with Howard Phillips and Company. Um, I own a, an insurance brokerage firm uh, that has been located in the District of Columbia for nearly 100 years. Uh, we've been continuously doing business in the district for that time. Uh, we currently employ uh, over 30 employees and we provide uh, employee benefits, the full range of employee benefits, uh, including medical and retirement plan, uh, life insurance, disability coverage. And I'm continuously challenged um, in the hiring of new employees, uh, uh, primarily based on where we're located. Uh, the challenge of, of the expense of employees coming into the city, uh, the parking, what have you, but we've, um, we've always met that challenge and um, have uh, excelled and, and, uh, and, and profit well, well in the District of Columbia. Uh, and I've always felt uh, comfortable that this is the place we want to be uh, going forward. Um, if the council uh, should pass a requirement that mandates us to uh, go into the exchange, um, unlike Mr. Melville who testified previously, we own our space in the District of Columbia. Uh, we could simply uh, put a for sale sign up sell our space and move to our uh, Annapolis location. Um, we've moved employees to that location over the years um, and I can tell you it would uh, it would reduce my commute into the city by, by quite a bit whether we went to Virginia or to Maryland. Um, that's not my intent uh, but it's, uh, it's a consideration and I felt compelled <coughs> to testify here uh, simply because I was considering uh, and, and I am considering 
uh, a move of my agency from the District of Columbia uh, as a result of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chandra, yeah. you may proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Alexander. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to provide comments about the D.C. Exchange. Uh, my name is Dave Chandra. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, an independent nonpartisan organization working at both the federal and state level on budget and policy issues that affect low and moderate income Americans. I'm also on the board of Mary Center, a federally qualified health center that serves over 28,000 D.C. residents. In addition to working with officials uh, in all states building an exchange, I'm very fortunate to participate in four of the short-term working groups, uh, the exchange working groups here in D.C., uh, including the important plan offering working group that was mentioned before and the employee choice working group. I believe that uh, D.C.'s process for discussion, for consensus building among diverse stakeholders, and for strategies moving forward even when consensus isn't reached has been one of the most productive I've seen in the country. Uh, we still have many policy issues to address, but together we've accomplished a lot in a very short period of time. And uh, thanks a large part to the leadership of the exchange, uh, the Department of Healthcare Finance, DISBE, and all the participants. Um, while the overall exchange planning has been going very well, city leaders and stakeholders uh, clearly continue to debate the issue of whether or not D.C. individual and small group markets should be consolidated into a unified market in the exchange. Some proponents have cited the need to have a large enough pool for the exchange to be viable. And while that's certainly true, I also firmly believe that adopting a unified marketplace is essential to ensure that all D.C. residents and small businesses have access to health plans that offer important consumer protections, that promote quality, and that provide high value. And that's what the exchange can offer. It is uh, the equitable and right thing to do in a city that displays such extreme health disparities and negative health outcomes. Now, many opponents of the unified market argue that it will substantially limit planned choice. And I believe the reverse could be true, that a new unified marketplace will promote more robust, meaningful choice. It's an issue that's being addressed right now in working groups as we speak. And while there's not yet consensus on how many plans should be offered through the exchange, uh, I actually believe it will ultimately reflect the quantity and type of choices that consumers, including small businesses, actually want. And that's what we're hoping to discuss together to come to that number. It's also important to remember that while employers can and should have adequate affordable options from which to choose, the DC exchange will provide choice to employees in ways that have rarely if ever been seen in the small group market today. Right now, the overwhelming majority of small employers offer only one health plan. Uh, the small business employees simply have no choice at all. Um, the small business exchange, called the shop exchange, will enable employers to offer an array of health plans to their employees, meaning that the exchange is increasing real choice to DC workers. Now, most importantly, though, the exchange is an ideal vehicle to foster competition in the insurance marketplace. Health insurance carriers will be required to line up all of their health plans and prices next to each other, side by side, on an easy-to-use website. Quality ratings and other important measures will also be included, creating transparency and real pressure for competition that simply doesn't exist in the current status quo market. This competition is key to helping us move beyond our very important first goal of just providing health coverage to people but getting to that next step of slowing the growth in healthcare costs and improving quality, value, and health outcomes. Um, now, recognizing that small businesses and other stakeholders have some very legitimate concerns about moving into a unified market by next January, uh, the Standing Advisory Board of the Exchange earlier this week on Monday voted in favor of adopting a two-year transition period. So if enacted, this plan would allow small business owners who currently offer coverage to continue purchasing insurance directly from their insurance carrier or a different carrier if they choose, both this year and into next year. So it'd be, they'd have the chance to transition um, up until when they renew their health insurance in 2015, allowing the exchange time to work out any kinks in the system and build up a robust array of options for quality, affordable co uh, coverage. And small business employees then, again, would eventually be able to have that increased access of choice and plans. So for these and other reasons, we support the unified market as well as the transition plan and look forward to working with you in the exchange, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I don't have any questions, just two comments. For one, we do not want to uh, encourage or force any business out of the District of Columbia. So we definitely want to make the best decision. And Mr. Chandra, you have your work cut out for you uh, to convince these two gentlemen sure. <laughs> that this is going to work. But you say a two-year transition period um, would work. So I think that's fair that we need to see how this will go because we want to give the whole purpose of the exchange is to have some viable workable options um, for our employers, our employees, um, for our residents in the District of Columbia. So we definitely want to keep our small businesses. I was just wondering, is there a cutoff, do you think, um, 
for the small businesses for it to work or for it not to work? I think in any policy decision there are certainly people who benefit more and some people who might benefit less or who, who may not benefit at all. Um, I heed very well our colleagues both among brokers and small businesses who are very worried. And I think even in the past month since the last time you had this hearing, we really appreciate you holding these hearings monthly because it has really forced us all to come together and come to these answers. Even our own position has moved a bit from learning from our colleagues. You know, maybe we wouldn't have considered a two-year transition as necessary, but hearing loud and clear from business owners the uncertainty, and, that helped educate us. And just are you confident that the same products will, could be offered that are currently offered to our small businesses? Do you think the same products could be? I, I think there's two important be things. Exchanged? Because of the Affordable Care Act, because of the President's law, a lot of things will change in 2014. So what's currently shaking their heads behind you? Well, what, what's currently out? I, unfortunately, I can't see see the folks behind me, but uh, I'm sure they, they may disagree with me, and that's fine. I think that's what the point of these working groups are: is to come together and have our different opinions out there and, and learn together. Um, no health insurance offered today, for the most part, will meet all of the requirements in the in the in law, or very very few. So things will change, and a lot of that will increase value, increase the kind of benefits, increase protections for consumers. But I understand. Price is really, really important, not just for em employers, but for all of us. And I think that the, what we want and what we're hearing loud and clear both today over the last month is, if we're transitioning to a unified market, make sure that there's enough choice, adequate choice, meaningful choice. And I think we should go back to our committees and whatever our plan offering committee that um, was referenced before, if the numbers we, we've been debating were not enough, we should go back and look at it and, and talk to our carriers and maybe add that. I think we're very open to that. I want every small business owner to look at this market in 2014, even if they're not compelled to go in it then, and say, yes, those are better options. And I really can't emphasize enough the fact that small business employees, who right now have no choice, one plan, that's it for most of them, to be able to choose from two or three or seven, like your big employers get to, that's a great, great step in a benefit. And I'd love to get there. And if we need to take two years to get there, I think that's fine. For, uh, Thank you. for yeah. Mr. Chandra's benefit, and uh, for the record, um, I have a 30-man uh, uh, company, and we offer three plans. Um, our employees have uh, many options to choose from. Um, uh, they have a HSA accounts to choose from. They have. Uh, as many options as uh, many of the larger employers that uh, that we service as well. That's good to know because price is important, but benefits are so important too. Some people will pay for what they, you know, what yeah. they want to have as, as a part of their health insurance coverage. So both are are equally as important. Great. Thank you all uh, for your testimony. I don't have any further Thank questions you. for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to call up. Wes Rivers, Mr. Rivers, um, Policy Analyst and State Policy Fellow with the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute, Nathan um, Perrine, or is it Perrine? Perrine? I've heard it all. Okay. Vice President and Administration and Chief Financial Officer of American Coatings Association. And Adam Tenner. Mr. Tenner. <coughs> no, Adam Tenner. Uh, Don Blanchon. Don Blanch. Is that Mr. Tenner's yes, card? Okay. Welcome. Mr. Tenner is the executive director of Metro Teen Aids. So welcome. You may proceed with your testimony. Chairwoman Alexander, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Wes Rivers, and I'm a health policy analyst at the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute. D.C. FPI engages in research and public education on fiscal and economic health of the District of Columbia, with a particular emphasis on policies that affect low- and moderate-income residents. I'm here today to testify in support of the recommendations of the Health Exchange's policy work groups and the transitional approach being proposed to unify the individual and small group market under the D.C. Exchange. For many years, the district has made a deep commitment to helping residents gain access to basic health coverage. Both through the development of the Health Care Alliance and through the aggressive expansion of Medicaid made possible by the Affordable Care Act. Moreover, due to the success of the district's small business sector and a strong commitment by these businesses to their employees, a number of D.C. small employers offer some of the best health insurance plans available on the private market. Despite this commitment to a healthy society, some of our residents remain uninsured or underinsured because they are not eligible for public programs and they or their employer cannot afford high quality plans. 
The DC Exchange offers an opportunity for the insurance industry, consumers, and the district government to foster a marketplace where health plans meet the needs and pocketbooks of all residents, while maintaining robust, high-quality choices for those lucky enough to already have top-tier coverage. DCFPI believes that market consolidation is the best long-term approach to ensuring that all residents have access to a robust set of affordable health plans. The greatest advantage to a unified market is a layer of transparency and oversight that has not previously existed in our market. Currently, DC is one of four states without a standard that ensures adequate access to doctors and specialists in a health plans network. The transparency and oversight mechanism within the exchange ensures that consumer protections intended by the ACA become a reality. The regulatory structure of the exchange makes certain that carriers are playing by a consistent set of rules and competing based on price and quality of their products. An exchange stakeholder working group has come to preliminary consensus on some quality standards that, to help ensure that consumers will have access to an adequate network of providers for any care they are seeking. The work group has come to consensus, although without a final vote, on mechanisms for monitoring the number and type of providers available in an exchange plans network. These standards specifically promote access to mental health and substance abuse services and providers that predominantly serve low-income communities. DCFPI supports these preliminary standards and foster a robust network of doctors, specialists in health plans sold on the exchange. We also understand that market consolidation has raised a number of concerns, especially with respect to choice. DCFPI supports the Exchange Advisory Board's decision to follow for a two-year transition period into the exchange for small employers with existing coverage. The decision recognizes that the exchange is a new marketplace and that small, business, small employers need time to evaluate new choices within the exchange and to observe how the exchange works. Moreover, like all, with all market, the exchange's regulators need time to evaluate and adjust standards within the exchange and ensure that small employers have access to a robust number of choices and meet their needs. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Rivers. Uh, Mr. Perrine? Thank you, Chairperson Alexander. Uh, my name is Nathan Perrine, and I am the Chief Financial Officer of the American Codings Association, a 501c6 trade association representing the manufacturers in the paint and coatings industry. The American Codings Association has existed for 125 years and is one of the nation's oldest trade associations operating out of the old Alexander Graham Bell Mansion on 1500 Rhode Island Avenue, Northwest. We employ 42 individuals with most working at the headquarters office in the District of Columbia. We appreciate the, in the initiative and leadership shown by the district officials in the implementation of the health exchange provisions of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. However, we are solidly opposed to any mandate that requires our association to abandon our current health plan, which has served us well. Our health plan is affordable, and it provides high-level coverage for all employees and their families, beginning on the first day of employment. In fact, we believe the strength, consistency, and flexibility of our health plan allows us to differentiate ourselves from other employers in a positive way. Our philosophy has been and continues to be one of providing high-quality benefits to our employees. We believe that a high-quality compensation and benefits package, including health insurance, allows us to attack, attract and retain above-average staff, which translates into higher value for our membership. We believe that this philosophy is in harmony with the Affordable Care Act, with the intent of the Affordable Care Act, and that our association is a responsible employer that provides affordable and comprehensive health insurance to our employees. Our health plan is made available to our employees at little to no cost to them, with the association bearing the entire cost of the premium in most cases. We are not opposed to the creation of a district-based public health exchange. We applaud the members of the committee who have championed the cause and shown leadership in the exploration of a viable system. However, we must categorically reject any mandate that forces our association to abandon the health coverage that serves us so well, from the mailroom up to the chief executive. There is nothing wrong with making an exchange an option for employers in the district. In fact, for many citizens and employers, a health exchange may well provide better benefits at lower cost. But we must voice our opposition to any proposal that closes the private market. 
altogether and forces small employers into a public exchange. Surely the intent of the act could not logically have been for the public exchange component to limit options, but rather to introduce a larger universe of healthcare options and thereby extend coverage. If a voluntary public exchange is not a viable option, it would seem that the citizenry of the district would be better served by allowing participation in the federal health exchange that is being established. It would seem that the intent of the Affordable Care Act would be better met by introducing more health care options by maintaining a private insurance market alongside a public exchange option. In closing, we urge the committee members to consider the practical and equitable implications of an ironclad mandate for small employers to eliminate their current health coverage offerings. We encourage the committee members to instead consider the intent of the Affordable Care Act and of the promises made by the President and to question whether the proposal before the committee fulfills that intent and those promises in the best way. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Tanner, you may proceed. Good morning. Um, uh, we're gonna be a little, I'm going to be a little bit of a square peg in a round hole today. Um, uh, we're, we're here very much to be supportive of the process. There's a number of, a uh, coalition of us uh, who are very interested in the health of adolescents and children uh, in the district and making sure that the discussion about health of adolescent children actually makes it to the table. Um, what we've been able to participate in, we feel, is uh, obviously mostly about insurance and about finance, but not necessarily about health. Um, we know that from in the District of Columbia, m most of our residents already do have some level of insurance, but we also know that utilization is poor and our outcomes are worse. So we're here to just ask your office to help raise the voice and ask for the, the uh, exchange to consider conversations, uh, I know upcoming conversations about quality. Uh, hopefully uh, we have recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics that we're happy to work with your staff to, to get. There's, there are specific things to work on to make sure that we don't underserve uh, the children and young people of our community. Uh, uh, we are learning as we go and we are happy to be here and be helpful as we can. Um, we really see this as a marathon uh, discussion about health uh, for the district residents over the next few years. Um, so we're here and we'd like to be as helpful as we can uh, and uh, we also look for your guidance to let us know where we can be most helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Mr. Tenner, I wanted to applaud you for the work that you do oh, and you. the community. Um, I'm well familiar um, with you, very familiar with your group. And it is important for our younger population um, our teen population or even 18 to 25 because a lot of them don't those are the ones that really don't really care about insurance you know they don't think that they need it they're overall healthy and there are concerns that we do need to reach out to that population that could in fact be a large um, piece of the uninsured in the District of Columbia so when it comes to the community outreach I know uh, the board is is discussing ANCs to outreach, but your organization definitely has a population that needs to be um, reached out to. Definitely, and, and we're happy to insurance. Yeah, we're happy to help however we can, and also we believe making sure that the conversation is larger about how to make sure that our schools are talking about how to adequately utilize health care. Right? I mean, how do we get kids to go home and say? You know, mommy, I don't need to go to the emergency room for an earache. I need to right. go to my primary care physician. Now, how can we change the utilization so that our outcomes grow so that we actually have healthier kids? Um, Definitely, because that is a shock when you look at the statistics of our insured and then some of our health outcomes. disparities. Yeah. It doesn't add up. No. If we have insurance, we need to go for preventive care. So, yeah, you definitely will play a major role um, with that. I wanted to ask Mr. Perrine, why is it, or why is it that smaller companies seem to want to be included in the exchange? I'm hearing, I guess the cutoff I'm hearing may be about 15 to 20 employees as opposed to larger groups. Why do you think the smaller groups benefit more, or they seem to say they want to mm -hmm. become a part of the exchange? Uh, uh, Chair, uh, Chairperson Alexander, a couple of reasons. It could be more, um, it, it could be less expensive for them to do that. In fact, it may be less expensive for us to do that, but I don't know. I would like it to remain an option to join the exchange. Uh, in the free market, an option it is always better than a mandate. Uh, if you're going to force us 
we lose options. But maintaining both markets allows uh, free entry into the public exchange for those uh, who would benefit by it. Thank you. And Mr. Rivers, thank you again um, for your testimony. What works to me and what's so impressive to me is that we're talking about the open or closed market and now we're seeming to come to, you know, to a compromise or to work it out that we can look at two years and see how the exchange is working. So everyone seems to be on board with that time frame to give us the opportunity to see. So I do appreciate everyone working together and try to come up with this um, solution for now, it seems. So I appreciate all of your testimony, and I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving right along, Don Blanchin. Mr. Blanchin is the Executive Director of the Whitman Walker Health. Teresa Waters. Is Ms. Waters here? Ms. Waters, Senior Director, HR and Administration, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, American Immigration Council, and Ms. Kathy Hollinger. Ms. Hollinger, I don't see her. Are you? Kathy could not make it today. She has okay. the bug. So you are representing yeah. the Restaurant Association of Metropolitan yeah. Washington. That's the owner. And please, for the record, state you. That's the owner. Did you get that? <laughs> Thank you. You may proceed with your testimony. You. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and good afternoon. My name is Don Blanchon. I'm the Executive Director of Whitman Walker Health. Whitman Walker Health provides high quality affirming health care to 13,000 individuals in the metropolitan area, including 10,000 residents of the District of Columbia, many of whom are living with HIV AIDS uh, and or are members of the very diverse gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, and transgender communities that are in our city. Um, our health center team is comprised of more than 150 employees, uh, 34 direct uh, practitioners in both the medical and mental uh, and behavioral health area. Um, and we are on the front lines of care. And we are on the front lines of reform right now. Um, and I'd also like to add, um, we are a mid-sized employer um, at 150 people. Um, but we are a self-funded enterprise, um, largely because of the health conditions, the underlying pre-existing conditions. Many of our employees actually uh, are living with HIV. And so it makes it very difficult. And we have experience with what it means to try to, to work through um, uh, the marketplace and, and securing insurance for our employees. Um, we have very grassroots and community-based experience dealing with patients who have individual small group coverage. We know exactly what it looks like to work through some of the challenges. Um, and so I'm going to share with you a couple of things that are really not based on my own personal view or my organization's view, but really based on the patient and experience that our individuals see when they come to Whitman Walker and seek our help. Um, four points for you. Uh, first and foremost, the single market model is, is the best path forward for a successful health insurance exchange in the District of Columbia. It gets us the appropriate risk pool size. The risk pool can attract insurers. The insurers are then going to offer a set of products that can work for all of the different ranges uh, of businesses that we're concerned for. And then ultimately, there's information that's going to be publicly available to all stakeholders about the product offerings and pricing. And I think that transparency is really important both not just from the, the business side of this, but actually from the patient or the consumer side. Um, and then last but by no means least, it will absolutely create a level, pl a level playing field. So that's my first point. My second point is you know, there's been discussions um, uh, in the community about alternatives such as a second standalone market with the existing small group or voluntary participation models. And I would caution us to go down those paths because I think there are programmatic and financial risks for the District of Columbia. Uh, standalone markets running side by side with an already established market presents a lot of opportunity for risk to move to the district's exchange. And the last thing I think anybody in this room wants to see happen is, is that the district's exchange becomes kind of a second tier or second rate insurance offering that really doesn't work for a whole bunch of individuals. And, and I'd hate to see that. Um, the voluntary participation concepts get us to a place where we might not have sufficient risk pool size and therefore can't attract insurers and can't then offer uh, an array of products. Um, 
My third point, um, and I think you said this um, eloquently, uh, Madam Chair, it's all about transition planning. I, I think there actually is a consensus emerging, and it's really what's it going to take over the next two to two and a half years to get us into a place where this can work for all of the, the key stakeholders. Um, and last but by no means least, um, we need to move beyond this discussion about single market. There are so many other things that need to be done between now and October 1st, many of them affecting the direct delivery of care, network adequacy, benefits and those things. And those need to be the focus of our work. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I did mention that, too. Benefits are so important. So thank you for, for stressing that. And I can imagine with your, with your insurance coverage currently, a lot of those individuals probably would not be able to go, well, currently with the individual um, insurance to, coverage. To cost prohibitive, yeah. And do you think you would experience a greater savings? You definitely would with pre-existing conditions existing. So we have some we have some kind of transitional challenges with the Affordable Care Act because of our employee, you know, employment size. We're going to be a later potential joinee um, if you looked at the transition of how ACA looks at building the exchange. So one would hope that if the exchange is robust and works really well that Whitman Walker looks at this in the future. Um, should we try to go out and, come, and try to find a, an underwritten policy for our 150 employees? Um, it would be significantly more expensive than what we do now with self-funded and stop-loss coverage. So do you feel that the exchange is going to offer the same <coughs> coverage? Well, they would have to. Um, the same coverage that you receive now, I'm sure you have extensive. So yeah, we do, and I think one of the things that I want to, you know, I'll come back to regularly in the, in the question and answer round would be, uh, the things that we have now aren't going to be the things that are available as businesses three to five years from now because there's a lot of market change and this notion of, well, there might be 70 or 80 products out there now and it's going to get, you know, there's going to be elimination of choice. I think some of that's going to happen no matter what because of the nature of ACA. So I think there's going to be some narrowing of the window. Our issue is still going to be this notion of how do we take care of people who have significant, you know, chronic conditions both on our workforce and also for the patients who are coming through our health center. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You. And next we'll hear from Ms. Waters. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. On behalf of the American Immigration Lawyers Association and the American Immigration Council, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Teresa Waters and I serve as the Senior Director of HR for both of these organizations. AILA employs a staff of 58 and AIC a staff of 22. I am here today to express my support for the continuation and preservation of the private health insurance market for small employers and individuals in D.C. Although intentions may be good, as a business, it is simply wrong for the D.C. Health Exchange Board to dictate where I purchase health insurance as long as I am willing to provide coverage for my employees. As a business that generally cares about its employees, I'd rather not risk or switch coverage, plan design, and quality of care for the proposed untested and unknown. Personally, I think it's time to call a spade a spade. The requirement for employers to participate in the insurance through the exchange has really nothing to do with affordable health care. The driver of this decision stems solely from the claim that mandatory small employer groups are needed to make the exchange financially sound. Otherwise, participation in the exchange would be voluntary. Essentially, in addition to covering costs for our employees, small employer groups 55% of the D.C. insurance market, larger than any single subset, is being told to also subsidize the cost of maintaining the exchange. Unlike the obvious need to provide coverage for the uninsured and underinsured residents of the District of Columbia, no one, especially members of the Health Exchange Board, has polled employers to ask, A, is there a problem with the current system? B, are they unhappy utilizing the current system and competitive market? Or C, as a small employer, what is of most importance to me if I have to purchase coverage through the exchange? 
And when I've attended meetings, the focus is usually on community-based organizations and how best to get residents enrolled. I have yet to see any communications or discussions geared towards the small employer. Um, although suggested, it hasn't been proven that participation in the exchange will be more cost effective than what is available today in the private market. There is no data which proves coverage for employees will be better than what they currently have. Like a decision when you're purchasing a car, there's always a cheaper version, but not necessarily better. As an employer, after salary, benefits are our highest cost. If we wanted to reduce or make coverage more affordable, we could have done that a long time ago by either increasing co-pays or out-of-pocket expenses. But our current plan design is driven not by cost, but by the unique needs of our employees and the desire to provide top quality health care. Cookie cutter plan designs being considered under the exchange simply are not what we are looking for. Regardless of size, if there is a mandate for, for employer participation in the DC Health Exchange, I believe that mandate should also include the DC Health Exchange Board, the DC Council and its staff, and all government employees of the District of Columbia. If DC is not willing to participate in its own health insurance plan, why should any other small employer? Um, as an employer, we don't support this recommendation, regardless, regardless of whether it's 2014 or 2016. We know what is best for our employees and strongly believe that any business operating in D.C. should have the fundamental right to choose. Finally, I'd like the council to please consider that if a decision is made to have small employers participate in the exchange by mandate, have that decision come from the council and not from the DC Health Exchange Board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Waters. That was the challenge that you gave us <laughs> out there. We want the council, the district government, everyone. I to just join believe the that if you're saying it's good enough for me, it should be good enough for you because well, it really is the state well, exchange. Well, we would resolve the issue. If the district government moved to the exchange, then we would have enough people in the exchange. Exactly. So that was <laughs> well, let's do that then. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. And you may proceed representing the restaurant. The restaurant Association, Metropolitan Washington. I, uh, would like to offer Kathy Hollinger's apologies for not being here this afternoon. Um, but on her behalf, I would like to present. Oops. I would like to present uh, for the Restaurant Association, Metropolitan Washington. Our association was established in 1920 in the district. REMW was formed to unite restaurateurs and food service industry professionals of the Washington area. Today, REMW has more than 700 members in Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, and Maryland, and serves the voice of establishments ra ranging from casual eateries to internationally acclaimed fine dining. REMW represents an industry that brings in over $2.6 billion in re revenues estimated for 2012 and collects $260 million in taxes annually and employs over 49,000 people in the district alone. I would like to take a moment to thank you, Council Member Alexander, for convening this roundtable. REMW members sincerely appreciate your efforts to include the small business community in this discussion on the issue of open market accessibility. The impact of the Affordable Care Act of 2010 will be significant for labor-intensive industries such as the res restaurant industry. We have very real concerns about the health of our small businesses in adjusting to the higher cost of covering greater numbers of employees than ever before. Add to these overall concerns the potential that insurance products on the exchange could be higher than what might be 
available on an open market, and our members are doubly wary of future insurance costs in the district. Whether prices will be higher, the same, or lower is actually beside the point. As a new and untested program, we need the open market as a control and safety net, at least until this brave new world of affordable care is tested and tried. In addition, we have heard that the exchange programs will be written, tested, and user ready by the beginning of open enrollment in October 1, on October 1. We have also heard that the exchange cannot possibly be ready to sign up and process a significant portion of the uninsured workforce beginning October 1. We suspect that the reality will be somewhere in the middle. However, even one small glitch could create a massive administrative bo bottleneck that without the open market will leave employers with no options to comply with the law. The potential costs and battle readiness of the exchange are legitimate concerns for every small business employer in the district. The exchange system will be cutting its teeth on a segment of the business community least likely to be able to absorb the shock of an untried system. We sincerely hope that the health exchange, health benefit exchange of the District of Columbia succeeds and becomes the one-stop shop for affordable coverage that we all envision. However, we also sincerely hope that the exchange, that until the exchange is tried, tested, and proven, the open market is left standing as a common sense backup and safety net. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are, are any of you with any of the working groups? What working group? What working so um, we've been participating in the uh, consumer assistance and I believe the benefits, those two. Okay. And you? Consumer assistance and marketing. Thank you. Has the Restaurant Association been in any working group? We have, I believe, a couple of members that are participating in the um, billing and uh, plan choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I look forward to all of your um, all of your suggestions through the working groups as well. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And next up, I'd like to call up Stacy Glaser, Director of Human Resources, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Uh, Reverend Dr. Kendrick Curry. Pastor of the Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church in Ward 7, and Dr. William H. Bennett II, Chairman of the Good Success Community Development Corporation, also Pastor of Good Success Church in Ward 7. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Ms. Glazer, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Chairperson Alexander, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this proposal. My name is Stacy Glazer. I'm the Director of Human Resources for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. The Physicians Committee is a nonprofit that's been operating out of the district for 27 years. We're funded primarily through the generosity of individual donors who support our public health mission. Our mission is to pr promote prevention over treatment, nutrition over drugs, and human-centered research over and training over animal models. Our membership of over 150,000 includes physicians and other healthcare professionals as well as concerned citizens. We have 65 employees, 14 of whom work from home offices across the outside the metro area. Our total health insurance commitment for the past plan year was 396,000, which equates to 4% of our total operating budget. It's a priority for us to take good care of our employees and to that end we pay 75% of their health insurance premium and we also pay their deductible obligation. And the ability to shop rates and plan designs each year has been integral to our ability to manage the increasing costs of health care. For example, <laughs> several years ago we transitioned to a high deductible health reimbursement account which lowered our premiums by 40%. And as I mentioned, we commit to paying 100% of our employees' deductible obligations as needed. Over 90% of our staff follows a healthful plant-based diet that excludes unhealthful meat and dairy products. So as you would expect, our claims are below average. So while we're prepared to pay out 112000 to cover the full deductible for each employee, this past year we only had to pay 
$48,000 towards deductible payments, a savings of $64,000. And this exemplifies how having the ability to choose plan designs is integral to meeting our uni unique needs and preferences, which includes doing everything we can to ensure that the donations we receive are being spent judiciously. Now our rates have just increased 18%, so consequently, once again, we're exploring new plan designs that will hopefully mitigate the burden of increasing health costs on the organization and our employees. And we're not in favor of the proposal to close the private marketplace, which would significantly limit our choices. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. That's very interesting. So you're promoting um, good health through your organization, and you've lowered your deductibles. That's impressive. We've only had to pay out um, much less of a deductible because of the fact our employees are, are healthy. I'm just interested. What are some of the what are some of the things that you're doing to promote this? We could incorporate that in the district government. <laughs> Over 90% of our staff follows a vegan diet, and our mission is to promote a vegan diet to the general public for general good health as well as disease prevention and survival. And we do that through um, educating the public through online, uh, free online programs, through books, through literature, um, through outreach to um, the health professional community. Um, do you have a health facility in your office building? We do. A, 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 a gym? We, we do. We do. Um, our employees have a discount that they can take advantage of. Do you have vending machines in your office? <laughs> we don't have vending machines, um, but we do provide um, a lot of helpful snacks to our staff. We do a monthly oatmeal um, bar with uh, toppings and... Yummy, yum. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Thank you for being creative. So. You definitely have a lower rate based on the lifestyle of your employees. And we, and we really value having the ability to customize a plan um, with, our, with our carrier and also have the option of carriers um, so that we can, again, meet the unique um, needs of our staff. Thank you for your testimony. Really interesting. And Reverend Curry, Dr. Curry. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Alexander, um, who I might add is my beloved council member from the greatest ward in the city, Ward 7. Um, I'm the pastor of the Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church, and uh, I'm just excited to uh, be here today. And I congratulate you, um, Chairwoman, on being important um, for this important committee, and it's my uh, pledge that you will be. Um, supported by me and all of those that I represent in terms of this important committee assignment. I say to you that it is my pleasure just to be here um, and be one of the most significant and far-reaching health bills that has ever been enacted in this country in decades. It's the Affordable Care Act and it impacts our citizenry. The enactment of the Affordable Care Act is a historic opportunity for our country and our city to address one of the greatest forms of inequality access to affordable health care. In 1965, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, of all the forms of injustice, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. President Bill Clinton in his speech before Congress on September the 22nd, 1993, framed the problem this way. Millions of Americans are just a pink slip away from losing their health insurance and our serious illness away from losing all of their savings. Millions more are locked into the jobs that they now have just because they or someone in their family, <coughs> excuse me, has been sick or they have uh, what is called a pre-existing condition. On any given day, 37 million Americans, most of them working and their little children, have no health insurance at all. And in spite of all of this, our medical bills are growing at over twice the rate of inflation, and our United States spends over one-third more of its income on health care than any other nation on earth. I ask you, how humane is that? President Obama showed true leadership, real courage, and fearful resolve in pushing the Affordable Care Act through after many of his predecessors could not. 
now, despite the efforts of his opponents to repeal and overturn the law, which the Supreme Court upheld last year, the president is calling on leaders across the country to help him implement it. Here in the District of Columbia, more than 40,000 of our brothers and sisters live every day without the benefit of health insurance. They pay a heavy price for this in terms of their health and the health of their children. Of that 40,000, it is believed by some researchers that 12% are right now here in our ward, Ward 7. These are our people, our residents, who need quality, affordable health insurance. The Affordable Care Act promises every American the opportunity to have affordable coverage, and I am proud to know that the District of Columbia is one of the leaders in implementing the Affordable Care Act for its people. Creation of a health benefits exchange will allow individuals, families, small business owners to purchase coverage at a price we can afford. We need to do everything we can to make sure that the D.C. exchange is strong and stable so that it will serve our city for many years to come. To succeed, we must work together and focus on the greater needs of our community, for in the end, that's what is best for all of us. I am pleased by the D.C. Health Exchange um, Authority's outreach to faith-based communities and others. I look forward to working with you with the exchange in the months and years ahead, especially as we prepare our residents for enrollment this fall and coverage beginning January 1, 2014. The faith-based community stands ready to work with the D.C. Health Benefit Exchange and its partners to reach out to the residents and business owners who are eligible for benefits and make sure that they come forward to sign up. I believe that we all work together to build this system from the ground up and engage the community. We will succeed at creating a health care system in the nation's capital that is second to none. Thank you so very much for this opportunity to share my thoughts with you and your committee. Thank you for your testimony, Dr. Curry. And Dr. Bennett, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Council Uh Let me uh, congratulate you on your signing as the chairwoman of this uh, very, very, very important uh, committee. I might want to just uh, equate you to that young lady in the Bible uh, quoted uh, Esther, who came to the kingdom for such a time as this to save her people. And uh, I think that there is no more important assignment, uh, particularly for those like Dr. Curry and myself, who service the constituents predominantly of our um, ward. And so we are just absolutely appreciative of the fact that you now will have an opportunity to lead the efforts in this regard, uh, particularly uh, for those who in need are the most vulnerable amongst us. Um, I do not, uh, Council Member Alexander, come to purport to uh, represent all of the faith leaders, but I can say, as I, be, I know my dear colleague uh, here would represent, that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that there are more of us that are excited about the prospect of fully implementing the Affordable Care Act, uh, President Obama's landmark health uh, reform law, because we know that a healthy citizenry uh, is in all ways a healthy the community regardless of economic status and, uh, and also that uh, a healthy and having wealth without health is still a short death sentence. Uh, as my dear friend and your colleague, former man Marion Barry often says, how you see things depends upon where you sit. And for where many of us in the faith community sit, we see that the successful implementation of Obamacare is absolutely a matter of life and death. And that's what we're really talking about here and why I'm here to share that. We see people in our churches and community every day, council member, who, who absolutely are struggling to get the health care that they need uh, and that are struggling to pay the bills that are associated with illnesses and injuries. That uh, They make the choice very often as to whether or not they're going to go and try to get the care based on the fact that uh, they don't want to pile up additional health bills uh, and that kind of thing for their families. And so what we see is clearly that very often people are uh, having the unres uh, unfortunate result of, 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 of clearly having less than desirable good health care. 
And so, as you know, we're here because of the Affordable Act, and it can be, as I view it and as I'm sure we do, many of us do, a life-saving lifeline for so many families, uh, particularly those, again, uh, that are the most vulnerable amongst us. And so I'm excited uh, that this D.C. exchange is going to be a powerful tool to be able to address some of these issues to help people get the actual care that they need and for them to find appropriate and affordable uh, insurance coverages. As I oftentimes say uh, in my own sphere of influence, it's teamwork that makes the dream work. And so we know that uh, if this dream is to work, it is going to take all of us working together to create what we believe will be life-saving and life-enhancing situation. Just to close, I was honored to uh, go to uh, recently the Exchange Authority's Communication Summit uh, on February the 12th, and I was pleased to see the interest in this very, very important matter. Uh, 300 people, standing room only, all there to show their support for the work. And as the testimony has gone forward today, many are working regardless of what their particular vantage point or how they see things work. But I commend that staff for bringing the pieces together to have a healthy dialogue that will lead to a healthier citizenry. My own wife, Dr. Michelle Bennett, who's a dentist and owns uh, uh, the Relax and Smile Dental Family Dental Care in the city, attended the summit as well. And she was so happy, and we both agreed, that the information at the summit was helpful for business owners who employ employees as she does, and it's just absolutely invaluable. And it gives us absolutely better understanding of the exchange and how it's going to operate and what its enrollment processes and all of the assistance that it's going to offer people. Uh, as uh, that great lady Kathy Hughes said, information is power. But of course I add to that if you use it and you disseminate it. And so towards the end of the, uh, that end of disseminating information and helping uh, to advance this cause, I like Dr. Curry want to let you know that I believe that the faith-based community is an absolute natural ally to come alongside in this effort with you. We stand ready to do that. We know who our neighbors are. We know what the concerns are. We know what some of the challenges are. And so we just want to be of help to get this all important information uh, out to them from our pulpits and the various other ways that we can. So I've simply come to say in conclusion that many of us, council member, are in a faith community. We do understand the importance of this landmark legislation. We're appreciative of your oversight and prioritizing it so that monthly we will see where we're moving forward to do the best that we can. And we stand ready, as Dr. Curry has said, to work with the exchange and with the city council so that we can absolutely implement in an effective way this transformative health care act. We're here to serve so that the people can have life and indeed life more abundantly healthier. Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you. You know, I wanted to jump over the table when the ministers are speaking. You all just motivate me so much. But the faith-based community are ambassadors out there um, in the District of Columbia. You can reach so many more people. And we're worried about, uh, I guess we're worried about the viability of the exchange because we have so many insured already in the District of Columbia, but there's still a large pocket of uninsured right. in the District of Columbia. There's, sure, there's still a large pocket of people who don't take full advantage right. of the benefits that they have. There's still a large pocket of people who have pre-existing conditions who don't know that they can get, I guess, less expensive coverage. There's still a large pocket of people who don't know what the exchange is or what the affordable Care Act is. And that's why I applaud you. I know the advisory neighborhood commissioners are one avenue, but our churches are definitely an avenue that we can reach hundreds and thousands of people. We have to reach enough people to make this exchange work. So we are counting on you. And you did go to the summit. Mm -hmm. Have you signed up for a working group? I uh, didn't sign up for a working group per se, um, but I've been being kept abreast of what those working groups are. And as somebody said earlier, the whole marketing of this, and again, not to be myopic about it, but for the least of these, 
it, that is the issue, getting the information out. out. And uh, I think if we're intentional about that and, and strategic about that, we can absolutely, as a faith community, uh, do a greater work with that. And we'll be glad to help you get that message out as best we can. Thank you. Thank you for all of your work. Um, one of my staff members said we're going to um, incorporate a meatless diet here at the council, but I, oh, have, I haven't made that decision yet, but I am going to contemplate really heavily on that. And we should talk. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, our final um, three public witnesses before we hear from our executive witnesses, uh, Mr. Michael Syndrome. Diane Lewis. Is Miss Diane Lewis here? Uh, Miss Susan Walker. Miss Walker is from the DC Coalition on Long Term Care. So for the last time, Ms. Diane Lewis. All right, welcome and good afternoon. Mr. Syndrome, you may proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, all those with the sound of my voice. Michael Syndrome, disabled veteran, served our country more than most. I um, listened intently as uh, Stacy Glazer, the Director of Human Resource Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine spoke. How do you make a dog more vicious, Madam Chair? Any idea? You toss it a piece of bloody flesh. Yes. And what do you think the fast food for Mickey D's and all these meats that are righted up due to our behavior? Do you realize by birth and by design we are plant eaters? Yes. Look at our facial structure. We don't have canine teeth like a dog, cat, lion to shred tear meat. We have mole and millet to grind. Moreover, a flesh eating animal has intestines straight from mouth to anus. We have 32 feet of intertwined tubing by birth and by design we are plant eaters. That would be the best movie you would make, Madam Chair, and it would be very kind to your pocketbook, too, because the cheapest goods in the market are the, are the raw fruits and veggies. The processed foods and the flesh are the most expensive. They cause obesity, too, and our, our community is greatly obese. Would you agree? I uh, happen to catch in the USA Today, uh, February 22nd, this past uh, Friday, CDC, the flu vaccine ineffective this year for those over 65. And I quote, this season's flu vaccine was almost completely ineffective in people 65 and older, which could explain why rates of hospitalization and death have been some of the highest ever recorded for that age group, according to estimates released Thursday by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I will pass that up. Madam Chair, my spirit is vexed. And the reason is because in our state plan, we don't have chiropractic. We have conventional medicine, which is cost prohibitive. And you realize the American Medical Association, one of the most, if not the most powerful lobbies in the United States, has one of three tacks to address a medical malady. Either you burn it, you cut it, or you poison it. You burn it with chemotherapy or radiation, you cut it with the knife surgery, which is irreversible and no guarantee, or you poison it with the meds. And you realize the Greek word for mica means sorcery. And all too often, our seasoned seniors that go in to the healthcare providers, right, walk out with bags and bags of meds just merely to mask the problem and have overwhelming side effects. That ought not be. Which is back to my initial point. What about chiropractic? They're very good at a fraction of the cost of conventional medicine. Why are they not adopted in the state plan? I had offline with your uh, chief of staff, or chief of staff as it were, at Fisher, who indicates you all are working on legislation, but your predecessor was working on it too. How about accomplishing something in this lifetime? I can speak from personal experience. I had not one, not two, not three, not four, five herniated discs, and I viewed the MRI at Howard. I was in excruciating pain on all fours. I had the good services of David Kaminsky, chiropractor, who was able, without the knife or meds, to unpinch the back. Now, if he can do it for me, he can do it for all others that are in tremendous pain. And when you're hemorrhaging, right, with pain overwhelming, you really 
I'm at a loss as to what is the most effective, most conservative. But I can tell you, chiropractic works. Chiropractic. I know you're going to have an upcoming hearing with a full uh, of health care providers. And you have chiropractic on the uh, agenda. But yet and still, they're not on the state plan, and they need to be. Are you with me, Madam Chair? Yes, I'm with you. All right, let's, let's, get them, let's get them enrolled. And uh, because I'm speaking about one, Dr. Keita Vanderpool. Uh, the good grace of her heart, she's done some pro bono work. But you know, to keep the lights on and the staffers paid, can't do it on air. So that's where you all come in, that she's compensated, remunerated accordingly. If you have any questions, I'd be delighted to field them at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Syndrome. You know I'm introducing legislation on Tuesday with regards to chiropractic medicine, so I appreciate your support of that. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Susan Walker, good afternoon. Hi, how are you? Um, I thank you, Chairman Alexander, for this opportunity to speak to you again. I am Susan Walker, volunteer advocate with the D.C. Coalition on Long-Term Care, and I feel fortunate to have been the liaison to the Health Reform Implementation Committee and currently the Health Benefit Exchange in the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. I want to focus my testimony today on five work groups of which I have been a member, their process, and their outcome. I think the work groups have been the most effective, efficient, and democratic process to meet the HHS, CISAIO, and DC Council deadlines. The policy questions requiring <coughs> recommendations have been clear and focused. Consequently, a large number of people with expertise have volunteered and have made significant contributions to the discussions. There have been significant education by all surrounding the intricacies and the questions. The discussions have been lively, substantive, and questioning. Everyone has grappled in good faith and cooperatively with the complexities of this law and setting up this exchange from the ground up. The HBX staff policy experts have been very helpful in explaining what we can do and what the law mandates. We are most grateful for their expertise. The District of Columbia is fortunate to have people of this caliber, knowledge, and dedication working for the exchange and with the work groups. The consultant facilitators have also been knowledgeable in helping in framing the discussion and keeping everyone on track to complete the required task in two to three sessions. There are 14 proposed work groups. Five have completed their work, four are ongoing, and five have been, will be starting soon. They all hope to have their work completed before the end of March. I have attached the work group list from the HBX website for your information. The Essential Health Benefit Work Group was the first one that I was involved in, was completed their work, and made their recommendations to the Exchange Board. The Health Benefit Benchmark Plan was determined through a process outlined by the AC law. The guiding principles for selection were that it had to include district mandates, provide benefits in the 10 required health benefit, benefit categories, and provide consumers with a baseline benefit package to meet most universal health care needs. That plan is Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Care First, Blue Preferred, Option 1. The Health Benefit Exchange Insurance Committee, um, that comes directly from the brochure that we had read on the exchange. I have included the, um, the uh, health benefit essential for you so you'll have the knowledge of what's involved. Um, the work group could not change the benchmark plan, nor do I think we would have wanted to, because it is a benefit-rich plan. But we did have the charge uh, to look at the mental health and substance abuse parity, habilitation coverage, minimum requirements for prescription drug formularies, and substitution of comparable benefits. The work group came to consensus on all the questions except habilitation that is referred back to the exchange board. However, information on habilitation issues were provided to the health exchange board to inform their decision making. And I have attached to you for you also the recommendations from the Essential Health Benefit Work Group. The Premium Ability and Collection finished their meetings today and will be submitting the recommendation to the Health Benefit Exchange Board once the report is written. The group, the employer and employee plan, the employer and employee plan choice work group has had two meetings and will need at least two more before they can make their recommendations. However, they are making excellent progress. The Sister Grant Estimates Work Group has completed their work in two meetings and has submitted to Mila Kaufman a proposed budget to apply for in-person a sister grant. In-person assistance will be used in the initial phase of enrollment, allowing the benefit exchange to develop and fund their navigator program after the first year. 
This is a well, recent and welcome decision by CSIO. The Assister IT Work Group has had one meeting. They will reconvene their deliberations once the Consumer Assistance and Outreach Advisory Committee has deter determined some key policy decisions. And I am a member of the uh, Consumer Assistance and Outreach Advisory Committee. The Broker IT Work Group will complete their recommendations as soon as the Assister IT Work Group has completed their deliberations. And the two groups can then have a joint meeting to work out the final details about how they will function together in the exchange. Network advocacy and plan offerings, benefit standardization work groups are finalizing their recommendation reports and will present them to the Health Benefit Exchange Board at either the March 7th or the March 14th Executive Board meetings. The Qualified Health Plan Insurer Certification Work Group, I believe, has started and the work is ongoing. The IT policy and carrier IT work groups have not started, nor has the dental plan, the quality, or the financial sustainability work groups, but they will all start soon. Three advisory committees have been appointed, the Producers Advisory Committee, the Plan Management Advisory Committee, and the Consumer Assistance and Outreach Advisory Committee. They have either met or will be meeting soon, but it's too soon to report on their progress. As you can see, there's been a great deal of activity that I believe has been substantive, substantive and is helping the exchange make the key policy decisions that will inform its work as it fully develops. And I think it's also the reason why we're seeing so much coming together because of the people working together in these groups. Thank you uh, for your testimony. And uh, thank you for giving an update uh, because I'm going to ask Ms. Kaufman about the working groups as I well. hope she agrees with what I've said. <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope so, because you have it outlined here, so that would work if she did. I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague, a member of the committee, former chair of the committee, um, council member at large, David Catanian. I'd like to um, acknowledge him for opening remarks and any questions that he may have. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ms. Alexander. I want to thank the public witnesses for coming. Um, the, uh, the, the purpose of my presence here today will be brief. It's to applaud and congratulate uh, the Health Exchange for the work they've done to put together a performance bond with respect to this contract. This was a concern that we have had uh, given the, uh, the very tight time frame associated with implementing this uh, information technology system, this electronic um, eligibility system. The concerns that some of us have had about the the, the principal vendor uh, having never been a, a prime in one of these systems and some of the questions about the adequacy of the software. Uh, having said that, uh, it was uh, suggested uh, that, we, um, that we really had no choice given where we were uh, you know, in a timeline that we had to go forward and I pushed for a performance bond which would protect the city to some extent in the event that this entity was unable to provide the service in a timely fashion. Uh, my understanding is it will be a, form, a face value of a $5 million performance bond, which we will have immediate uh, access to in the event that there are any, uh, that it will serve as a protection for the city against any failure to perform following a minor cure period on the part of the vendor. Now, many of us understand that the total value of the contract is multiples of $5 million. But I think it, is, it establishes an important precedent that when we engage in companies like this, that if they are unable to perform, not only will we have access to them in a breach of contract, but that we will have immediate access to $5 million, which would allow us to jumpstart a replacement should that be necessary. And so I hope it's a strategy that we can incorporate going forward in some of our other uh, risk-based contracts such as this. But I wanted to thank um, Ms. Kaufman from the Health Exchange, and I wanted to thank all those from the administration involved uh, in uh, helping to facilitate this. And Madam Chair, as you know, we have a hearing that's kind of concurrent with this on truancy. I want to say that I uh, reiterate what I've said before, which is I'm, I'm enthusiastic about our Health Exchange. Uh, I know some are calling for a transi transition period before we require the system be a closed system. Uh, I, I support that. Uh, I continue to hope that we'll be able to, uh, once we have our new managed care organization selected for Medicaid, that we will require those three vendors to be on the exchange and that that can be, um, that that can be the place where uh, people go first for uh, insurance. Uh, you know, I think after a year or two uh, with this particular population, many of whom have not been insured, we can, through that 
effort, we can have an understanding of what their costs might be, uh, and that if there are kind of costs above and beyond uh, that which we, are, we anticipate, that the city would pay those costs as opposed to um, a private smaller companies having to burden those costs, raising their prices, and ultimately perhaps forcing some of those companies that are not required under the Affordable Care Act to provide insurance opt to not provide it, and that's a concern. So until we know kind of what these real costs are, I think it's a prudent measure, uh, and, and it, you know, we may have perfection right around the corner, but we want to be measured in how we implement it. So I want to thank you for uh, your chairmanship and for giving me this uh, opportunity to say a few words. I'm going to return to my other hearing. Okay. Thank, thank you. you, Council Member Catania. Uh, yes, Mr. Catania, before you depart, please don't forget me because I haven't forgotten you. The two issues that remain pending and active. Excuse me, Mr. Syndrome. No one asked you a question. Thank I'm you. making a statement. Uh, no one asked you anything. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, thank you. Um, and Council Member Catania, one of the key um, one of the keys to the success of the exchange is first and foremost to get it up and running. Um, so our IT system, I thank you for your due diligence uh, and ensuring that with regards that we have some guarantees and we have some assurances that this is going to work and if it doesn't, you know, we'll, we'll deal with that performance bond. So I do appreciate um, you pushing for that as well, so thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. We're going to hear from our executive witnesses Madam Chair. first and foremost. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Syndrome. Do you realize scripture in Mr. Syndrome, thank you for your testimony. Nuts, fruits, and grains were the diet. And even the animals were fat eaters. And we'll hear from our executive witness uh, first from the Department of Human Services, Marina Haban. Thank you, and if you don't mind to raise your, your right hand, you're from the Department of Human Services as well. No, no, Office of Contracting and, and Procurement. Procurement. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, and if you could state your name for the record, sir. Derek White. I'm sorry, I was told there was one more public witness, if you could bear with me. You can yes. stay seated. Please stay seated. Ms. Karen Harvey. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could state who you're representing a particular organization. Of course. Thank you so much. My name is Karen Harvey, and I'm the Director of Human Resources at the American Public Transportation Association. We represent the Trade Association of the Rapid Transit Industry in the Washington, D.C. Um, area where WMATA, of course, is our member and one of your largest employers. Um, thank you today for letting me uh, testify. I do appreciate um, the opportunity. The um, PPACA requires health insurance exchanges to be established in the various states and the District of Columbia. People who do not have access to health care plans through their employers will be able to join this as has been established all day today. In discussing these exchanges, President Obama first said, if you're one of the more than 250 million Americans who are already have health insurance, you will be able to keep this health insurance. This law will only make it more secure and more affordable. The D.C. Health Benefit Exchange Board's proposal to require employers in the district to obtain coverage for their employers, employees exclu exclusively through the exchange and close the private market flies in the face of the announced intent of the PPACA and threatens the ability of the employers such as APTA to attract the high caliber of employees we have historically employed. We believe employers such as APTA should retain the absolute right and the flexibility to obtain its employee health insurance coverage independently. APTA traces its roots to 1882. Its more than 1,500 members are public agencies engaged in the provisions of the transit services and businesses that provide the goods and the services those agencies rely on. Um, our association provides its members with an array of services including training, standards development, safety auditing, and advocacy. 
Our employees are subject matters and experts in all aspects of public transportation and serve as resources for the transit professionals across the uh, country, North America, and the world. It is important to note that APTA draws from a very broad international pool in order to attract the very best talent. APTA's employees are drawn from the public and private sectors as well as academia and other associations, not just in the U.S., but internationally as well. Further, not all the employees reside in the greater D.C. metro area. In addition, like many associations, APTA utilizes employment contracts at the executive level. These multi-year agreements include specific requirements for health coverage care that are critical components of the overall hiring and retainage package. To ensure that we attract and retain the best and the brightest practitioners in our industry, APTA provides its employees with excellent health benefits. And, um, we employ a benefit advisor to advise in the crafting and obtaining comprehensive coverage at reasonable rates. Certainly, we obtain coverage through Blue Cross Blue Shield and provide four different pl plan options, excuse me, for our em employees with a variety of employee contribution and co-payments. Our ability to craft and attract plans such as this would eliminate by the current proposal and would be and would put the sustainability of our workforce in jeopardy now and in the future. Moreover, the proposed mandatory closing of the private market might prove more expensive for us and other employers. Payroll administration would be extremely challenging, such as in, since employers would select plans and coverages through an internet site without notification to the employer. APTA's lease will expire in 2015, and right now we are evaluating other options at our, of our next location. We must definitely consider looking at other jurisdictions, Maryland and Virginia, because of the stringent nature of the DC exchange. In order for APTA to be successful, we need to be close proximity to Congress and other federal governing bodies. However, if the DC exchange closes the private market and continues on in this fashion, you will leave us no other choice but to move to another jurisdiction. Finally, we believe our employees will be poorly served by closing the private market and shifting to a mandatory participation within the exchange. Currently, our employees have access to expert consultants who can assist them in choosing from among APTA excellent health plans, matching the plans and the needs to our employers. Our benefit advisor also would provide advocacy on behalf of employees. They can intervene with insurers where necessary and protect our employees' interests. The service level will be lost under the current proposal. APTA and other similarly situated employers might retain the, must retain the ability to close a health plan, to, I'm sorry, to choose a health plan that best fits their employees on the open market. This plan must have the flexibility to choose appropriate health care for our employees. The proposal to force us to participate in the DC exchange and close the private market will be harmful to us and our employees. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, you stated your association has over 1,500 um, members, correct? That's correct. So you would not be considered a small business. No, that's members. We have 90. We have 90 employees at the moment. Oh, okay. So we are not considered a, a small employer. Oh, However, we are very concerned in the two years that it will become necessary for us to join the exchange for to keep on the open market. Okay, I got you. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And you don't have to thank you. I don't have any further questions. Your points um, have been well taken. Thank you. Uh, and we are discussing the transition period. Absolutely. How things work out. So I appreciate it. And while the executive witnesses are here, if you would like to um, leave the table, you're more than welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for your patience and for your time. Mm -hmm. And next, we'll hear from our executive witnesses. And once again, that's Mr. Derek White from the Office of Contracts and Procurement, and Marina Havan from Department of Human Services. And you two can remain seated. Please raise your right hand. And do you affirm, under penalty of law, that the testimony you're about to give the Committee on Health is the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but? I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, Mr. White, you have written testimony. I do not. You may proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Alexandra, members 
of the Committee on Health. I'm Marina Havan, Chief Information Officer of the Department of Human Services. Today I'm here to provide testimony on behalf of the administration regarding the District of Columbia Health Benefit Exchange Authority, but more specifically to discuss the DC Access System, DCAS. Not over one in three district residents receive some type of assistance from one or more district health and human services agencies. The district's Medicaid and related programs serve over 240,000 individuals, or nearly 40% of all DC residents. In addition, multiple program beneficiaries are common. For example, of the 18,000 families who receive cash assistance from the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TANF, program, nearly 100% are also covered by Medicaid, and over 90% receive SNAP benefits. These and other residents receive services and support through a variety of agencies working in different locations throughout the district. While existing district agencies and departments operate with internal efficiencies and effectiveness, they generally have little ability to identify common clients and coordinate their efforts. Each agency's business process focus on the needs and rules of each program, leaving the substantial burden of navigating multiple systems to the individual or the family. Each program's information system also mirrors the silo agency involvement structure. To overcome this fragmentation, the district applied for, the, for and received federal funding to create a coordinated, highly automated eligibility and enrollment system that will be integrated with HBX. This new system will form the basis for integrated health and human services in the district. The goal of the DCAS is to establish an individual and family-centered approach that supports customer-driven service delivery and allows government agencies and programs to work together effectively and efficiently to help customers achieve their goals of self-sufficiency and well-being. Once fully implemented, DCAS will transform the way government representatives and customers benefit and services by assisting the, with the following. Allowing social service representatives to spend their time working through applicants' needs instead of extensive data entry and policy determination that they currently do. Allowing customers to enter or give their information one time on their own or with assistance into a common application for health, insurance, and public benefits. Allowing the capability to pre-screen for potential eligibility for ben public benefits simply by entering basic household and income information. Allowing for real-time Medicaid health insurance exchange eligibility notification when all of the data elements are available. Allowing consumer, consumers to have 24 by seven access to My Account features and allowing consumers to have the ability to apply in person, by phone, on the web, or by fax and or email. In addition, the system will significantly improve DHS customer service by expanding its call center, supporting integrated and unified case plans, establishing robust customer residency verification, and reducing system redundancies. In addition, the system will significantly improve customer service by expanding its call centers, supporting integrated and unified case plans, establishing robust customer residency verification, and reducing system redundancies. I'm sorry, I repeated that. There are huge costs associated with replacing legacy systems that currently support some of these activities. Our city has this once in a lifetime opportunity to leverage the substantial resources provided through the passage of the patient protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as the ACA. The funding authorized by ACA provides a way for the district to establish a health insurance exchange and replace DHS outdated automated client eligibility determination system, currently known as ACEED. The U.S. Department of hum Health and Human Services, Agriculture, and the Office of Management and Budget issued a tri-agency letter 
This letter allows states to bill the federal government for the vast majority of the costs associated with developing, implementing, and operating this new technology. Most of the cost can be allocated to funding for the new healthcare exchange at an enhanced federal match. What that means for the district is in the first year, 95% of the contract costs are borne by the federal government, saving the district millions of local dollars. The invest planning document, APD, jointly submitted by DHS and Department of Healthcare Finance to the federal government, set up what the district determined was necessary to meet the tight time frames for implementation of ACA as a condition of receipt of federal funding. Specifically, the approved APD proposed using commercial off-the-shelf products to maximize efficiencies. A vendor was selected through a competitive procurement process to help implement DCAS for the district. The vendor meets the criteria set forth in the RFP and software products, IBM Carom and Connecture, procured are being implemented in other states, including Maryland. The contract was signed on January 2nd, 2013. Today, only a short time into emphasis engagement, jointly we have developed a schedule to meet the October 1, 2013 Go Live federal mandate, nearly doubled the number of resources assigned to the project from the vendor side from the original plan, completely integrated the independent verification and validation vendor Accenture in the deliverable review process, dedicated over 30 subject matter experts from the government side to support requirement development, and onboarded additional government staff to perform oversight. Our current challenges include continuous new requirements from the federal government, onboarding new staff and ensuring they have come up to speed swiftly, ensuring our organization and district residents are prepared for the changes, and minimizing changes to our commercial off-the-shelf software to ensure we have a solid roadmap for future upgrades. In conclusion, we are transforming the way district residents are going to receive health care insurance and human services benefits. This is a very complex project with a lot of moving parts that I'm confident will fall in place enough, in enough time for us to meet the federal mandates and ensure that our residents receive the highest quality of access and service that they surely deserve. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, with regards to the off-the-shelf software, and I know that we have to tailor it um, to the needs of the District of Columbia, what are going to be some of the challenges in that process? Uh, well, as I mentioned, we're trying not to do uh, a lot of customization. There's configuration and customization, and we're trying to minimize that to be able to take advantage of the upgrades that are coming uh, about. The challenge for us is to make sure that the inputs that are being provided to us by the various work groups are included um, in, into the design of the system. What we have done in order to meet the mandates, though, uh, have <coughs> asked uh, the work groups to be conscious and considerate of the timeline and allow us to move forward with uh, moving some of their requirements to post October 1st. So when can you count on, I guess with regards to the application process, what you need to include on there? Is this feasible by October 1st? Yes. What, I mean, mentioned some things after October 1st. What, what are some of the mandates that are going to have to be in place? There are specific mandates by the federal government and they've been formulated in a uh, model application that they uh, released, uh, the federal government released, I believe, in uh, late December. Um, and it was re reviewed and will be put, hopefully finalized in March. So that application dictates what any software must do. So um, by the end of March? Yes. <laughs> now what, you can qualify, and you mentioned, so if a, if an individual qualifies for TANF, they automatically qualify for <coughs> Medicaid. That's correct. 
But if you can you qualify for Medicaid and not qualify for Correct. TANF? Yes, you What can. are those instances? Uh, I, I apologize. I'm not familiar with the uh, detailed policies um, in, in terms of the, the distinction between people who do qualify for Medicaid and not for TANF. I believe there are, we have Medicaid qualifications that are not income-based, whereas our TANF recipients are mostly uh, determinations are made based on income. Okay. So if a resident calls in and they qualify for both, you'll be able to service them in uh, the exchange as well for additional services? Not on release one. Uh, we have... I'm sorry, not on... Not by October one. Uh, we plan to bring in the public services, public benefits and social services eligibility determinations in outer years. Um, we hope that will happen by uh, fall of 2014. Our focus has been to meet the mandates by October 1, and those are only health benefit exchange uh, requirements. As we complete those and we roll those out, we have started discussions about how the public benefits will come in, and we have a model to implement those, but we do not want to introduce those to delay our implementation. And is there going to be a link, because I know residents can go to the different um, IMA centers, is there going to be a link with the systems um, at the, I guess, the different satellite, satellite human services locations to the exchange? Yes, and that's we're very excited about the, our interconnectivity in terms of individuals who are on the exchange. They're putting information onto the web. If they have questions, they can save their information, present themselves at any one of our service centers, and we will be able to pick up the application from where they left off and, and provide the service. So is the IT um, group going to incorporate through your computer system as well as the exchange. Yes, and our service centers would actually have access to both systems. And there's some details we're working at as in terms of one system talking to the other, uh, verifying and validating, and all those things are part of our implementation plan. So how long does the process take to determine Medicaid eligibility currently if a person comes in? And Current, have your system? Yeah. It's, it's approximately 45 to I would say 45 minutes, um, and that's because of the, <coughs> the complexity of the questions and, and depending on if it's an individual versus a family. So is that going to be the process if someone goes through the computer system or calls on the telephone or comes in person? There's going to be about a 45 minute. It's potentially possible, depending on the complexity of the family. We could, you may have a family that is eligible, children are eligible for Medicaid, uh, one adult is eligible for Medicaid, but the other adult is not. It all depends on the composition. Complex families will take up to 45 minutes to go through the application process, even on the web. And so if someone comes in, I don't have a... I don't have a job, I don't have any money, I don't have any income, that's like immediate. That will be quick. But you still have to, I mean, I guess once you put a social security number in, it'll come up. Yes, right? and that's where the difference for us now is that we will have access after October 1 to the federal data hub, which validates the social security, uh, validates if this individual is receiving care from the um, Department of Defense healthcare system, and all of those will be done instantaneously, which we don't have access to right now. So that impacts our ability to determine real-time Medicaid eligibility. Now with regards to the performance bond, um, and this is if the company is not reaching benchmarks, and I don't know if you're able to answer uh, specific questions, but for the overall Performance bond, I understand the amount is $5 million? Yes. We, but the uh, overall contract is how much? Is $80 million? No, the base year of the contract is $49,665,158. So what can a $5 million assurity give us? Oh, $5 million. But it's important to note, <laughs> it's important to note that that $5 million performance bond is in conjunction with very hefty liquidated damages that were included in the contract in addition to our standard clause of being able to re-procure at the cost, if we need to, at the cost of the contractor. 
So at what point are we going to say, and, and we hope that everything is going to work out. I, I want to start by saying that. At what point are we going to be able to re-procure or getting another company to do the job? Um, so to speak, at what point are you going to do that? We will not re-procure. This company will not fail, and I'll be there to make sure. Okay. Um, that and I know, and everyone is saying failure is not an option. Of course, we not. don't want failure to be an option, but we always have a plan B. Oh. So what is our plan B? Well, what happens if the company does not perform or if things are not up and running? by October. 1st. If the company does not perform and and, and we give And I guess we're gonna know this by what? By May, right? <coughs> by the spring. We'll actually know that before then. The the, the contract has approximately a hundred items of task. Each task is so each task has some task and each task is associated with a payment. Could you could you be specific on the benchmarks and the penalties? Is there a I guess is there a schedule yes. of benchmarks and penalties? That's what I was explaining. Yes, absolutely. Okay, could you be a little bit more specific in that? We have, uh, I think, the, we have the, our liquidated damages, which are um, were part of the original contract, are based on each uh, deliverable. So over the hundred that uh, Mr. White was explaining, each day missed on each one of the, those deliverables is a thousand dollars penalty for the vendor, and then we also have production issues, which are about thirty-five hundred dollars per hour if the system isn't performing um, at the at the timetable that we've provided them. So there, there are really five pages of liquidated damages in various categories that cover about a hundred tasks and their subtasks of this contract. This in addition to the performance bond. Gotcha. And at what point I would think if this company is paying penalty on top of penalty and not reaching benchmarks I mean, it's good to know that we can get, you know, our, our money back, but it's also kind of leery to know if they're not doing this, when do we say enough is enough? And, and that's the contracting officer's call, and that would be me. So um, when do you say enough is enough? So I, you know, I, say is en I say enough is enough when the contract administrator, the program manager, has said, okay, this company has failed and the program declares a failure, that's when they fail. And who's overseeing the benchmarks? Your office is overseeing? In conjunction with the program. And the contract administrator. In conjunction with the board. And what about um, Accenture? Are they the independent? Yes, Accenture is the independent verification validation um, entity that uh, the federal government actually requires us to have because of the large sum of funds that are associated uh, with the um, with the project. And they are, um, as I mentioned, they are uh, integrated with our deliverable approval process, um, and their reports actually are provided to the federal government, uh, apparently. So do they actually just approve, or are they given recommendations oh, recommend. and suggestions yes, they, as well? Yes, they provide full feedback, both to government as well as to the vendor. Okay. What will, I guess, what will trigger the performance bond for, for that to be utilized? So when the company does not meet, if the company does not meet the go-live date, I have no re reason to believe they will not, but in the event they do not, that will trigger um, the performance bond. So a total failure, not just meeting a benchmark. So if you don't meet particular benchmarks, a penalty will be imposed. In, in the form of liquidated damages. Okay, but if the whole program <coughs> is a failure, that's the only way the performance bond will come into play? That's called a trigger event, yes. Okay. And that's the only triggered event if it's not working the at all? If the system, if the IT system is a complete failure, then the performance bond will kick in. Um, or are there any, I guess, are there any um, occurrences when the benchmarks aren't met that the performance bond? No. At, at, at that point, liquidated damages come into effect. Okay, so what's the difference between 
the performance bond and penalties? The performance bond is, is not a penalty. Pen the performance bond is not a penalty. Um, that's more of an assurance, an insurance, if you will. What would be the total amount of the liquidated damages, the total dollar amount? Well, it's per, it's, it's per event, so there's no real cap. Um, and you said 3500 So, for, for, for example, let me give an example. Um, in the category of system availability, um, the liquidated damage is 3500 per hour or any portion thereof. Okay. So, and, 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 and you know, that's... Um, you mentioned that and you mentioned 1500 or something to so, it. 1,000, I think. So, so well. in the areas of performance metric, there's a um, liquidated damage charge of $1,000 a day. So at some point, we would be able to balance our, our the cost that we put out. At some point, if there was a failure, we would be able to capture the total amount of the contract. In theory. What's in theory? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't know that to be the case. The purpose, so on the liquidated damages front, we expect if, for example, if there's a failure and we assess $3,500 an hour, we expect that failure to be corrected. Okay. I'm not and, in terms and, of and are you also looking at um, Maryland as well um, and keeping up with them um, to make sure that Maryland is actually going to be up and running since they're doing that too? Um, um, there are a number of go and no go uh, events for, uh, the, for our implementation that are set up by the federal government. Um, Maryland, because of an, being the early, early innovator state, they're a month in advance of us. Um, so we will know when they go through their first go no go test, what to anticipate. And that's part of the reason that we are confident that we're going to meet the deadline with the current uh, vendor uh, because what we have that is required by the federal government is what Maryland is implementing in, and it becomes part of the core software. So the changes they've made to the software to meet federal mandates are what we are receiving. So th that's really part of the reason that we feel confident that we'll make the deadlines. We have earlier innovator states that are, are doing the, uh, that are using the solution, and it's a solution that was um, approved. And so when, when is the, uh, what's the length of time to recertify so that you can assure that someone is still eligible um, to receive benefits? If they are Medicaid eligible, how often do you re, re we certify. I, um, I can give you a number, but um, it won't be, it's not my core expertise. Um, I, I believe a Medicaid certification is... Um, is it six months? I think it's or a year. A year. Uh, but I, I, ha I would have to get back to you. So I'm when I'm just wondering, and yeah. I'm asking for the program purposes, when a person qualifies for the Medicaid, is there going to be a flag? in the system because I'm sure different people will call in at different times. So are you going to, is there a, um, is there a mechanism for the exchange to reach out to people or is the mechanism going to be that you're going to depend on those persons to come back to you? I believe there are a number of activities that are that our business um, side or program group are engaged in and how to deal with people who are Due to be recertified in the fall of 2013, um, the federal government has provided some flexibility in terms of those certifications. If they would be automatically certified for a certain period of time, so in, in, in not to overburden the system when we're going uh, for the open enrollment season. So those things are still being worked out. They aren't um, established. Uh, pieces, but those are definitely things that some of our uh, dedicated individuals on the DHS side and healthcare finance side are looking at. Thank you. I would like to know what how that's mm -hmm. going to um, run with regards okay. to recertification. Thank you for answering about the um, performance bond and the contractual 
um, process, but I guess I know that you'll be following that along with the center, along with the board, along with human services, so everyone will take an active role. We have at least four stakeholders that are going to ensure this is going to work, and this is all null and void because you say, stated failure is not an option. So we are going to be up and running smoothly um, by October 1. So I'm confident with that. So thank you for your due diligence and thank you for your testimony. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. And next we will hear from our board of the Health Benefit Exchange, Dr. Mohammed Akhtar, the chairman of the board, and Neela Kaufman, the executive director. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> And you may proceed with your testimony. I do have a copy. Oh, first and foremost, I'm sorry. If you would raise your right hand. Do you affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give the Committee on Health is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but? I do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Madam Chair, for. Um, uh, inviting us this morning, uh, this afternoon, I should say, rather, uh, for uh, this um, wonderful hearing. Um, as you heard from all the participants, how participating process it has been in terms of building the exchange from ground up. And I'm very pleased to report that we had excellent cooperation from our sister agencies, particularly from Healthcare Finance, Director Turnage is one in the audience here, from the Insurance Commissioner's Office and from the Department of Human Services and all the stakeholders in the metropolitan area basically has been participating. Several hundred people are participating in the work of the exchange because we want to do it right. After 100 years we had this opportunity to do it and we want to do it right. The board consists of seven volunteer members. They are unpaid volunteers. They give a lot of their time. They have nothing to sell. They are not representing any special interest or any special organization. They are interested in just one, and that is the people who need help, small businesses who need help. That's their sole focus. And to understand that focus clearly, we need to recognize who these people are. At any given day, there are 35,000 people living in Washington, D.C. who are uninsured. If you look at over a period of year, there are 63,000 people who at some part of the year they are uninsured. They were on Medicaid, then they got dropped. They got a job, then they lost their job. 63,000 people are in that position. About the same number of people, Madam Chair, are the folks who are underinsured. These are the people who are very high deductible. They have the insurance, but until, unless they're close to dying, they ain't going to go get their care. You know, they let their child suffer all night from asthma. They don't go to the emergency room because they have a very high deductible. Can't afford to pay for it. So we're talking about 150,000 people in, in the district who really need help. So as much as I'm concerned about all the other special interest groups for whom I have tremendous respect working with us, we also do it right by the people. This is all about the people. That's why we are in this business. That's why we serve on the board to meet that, 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 that requirement. And I want to assure you, we're going to continue to work collaboratively. But our eye is going to be always toward those folks, as Reverend Barron said, to the people. So the people could have real life. And they could do other part of their, their work. Many times people are poor because they don't have a job. But a lot of time people are poor because they're sick. And I want to tell you this a lot more often in our community than it is anywhere else. Because people are sick, they can't work. They can't work, they don't have insurance. And insurance is the gateway to getting quality care. And that's our task. That's what, that's what we are here for. So once in a while I need to remind when all the interest groups come in and talk about, you know, don't do this, don't do this, not in my backyard, don't do it, to, to us, it's not doing to anybody. It is community as a whole, lifting the folks up who are on their hands and knees every day, single day, looking towards us to provide the health insurance so that they could have the health care coverage. 
I've asked my colleague, Ms. Kaufman, uh, who is our executive director, has done a tremendous job to present the testimony on behalf of the board. So, Ms. Kaufman. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with you uh, this month, and I look forward to being with you every month <laughs> until your birthday, um, October 1. Um, I wanted to specifically give you an update on five areas um, that you express specific interest in. The first one being our efforts to staff the exchange. The second one being the work of our policy working groups and our advisory committees. The third one, discussions to transition to a more competitive insurance market for residents and employers in the district. The fourth being our work with community-based organizations and our outreach efforts. And um, the fifth being our progress on IT. And I would like uh, for the for my full written testi testimony to be included in the record. I will just highlight a few uh, uh, points for you from each of those um, areas. Um, first, the new staff, and this is probably the most exciting news uh, uh, to share with you. I'm pleased to tell you that on Monday, we announced the, the addition of five ta talented men and women uh, to the Exchange Authority staff, and I'd like to introduce to you and ask them to stand as I do. Uh, first, Jeff Gabardi. Uh, Jeff is our new general counsel, and he comes to us with, uh, with significant health insurance expertise. Most recently, he was a senior um, executive uh, at AHIP which is a health insurance uh, industry association, and he was also general counsel for HIA, uh, AHIP's predecessor. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, we also have Sarah Cormany. Sarah is our new director for information technology. Sarah has spent the last 14 years developing online software to help consumers learn more about health insurance, and she worked with organizations such as the American Cancer Society to do that. Most recently, she was with the federal government, specifically the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, where she worked on launching and managing healthcare.gov which many of you know is a highly acclaimed website providing Americans with information about the ACA and coverage options in their communities. In addition to Jeff and Sarah, uh, we have other new staff members, and I'd like to recognize Sandra Robinson. As many of you know, uh, and you've worked with Sandra for years, most recently uh, she was our interim executive director for the exchange, and she is now our new senior deputy director for operations and our chief operating officer. Thank you. Uh, in addition to Sandra, Bonnie Norton has joined our team as the new director for program implementation policy and strategic alliances, Bonnie and Brendan Rose, who has also joined us recently from, from DISBE to be our program manager for plan management. And as you know, both Bonnie and Brendan uh, were leading the district's effort to help establish the exchange. So I welcome all of them, and I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to be introduced to each new member. We continue to aggressively recruit to build our expert team, and we're specifically recruiting experts with significant experience with the Affordable Care Act, as well as significant on-the-ground experience, health insurance market experience, and program operations experience. We expect that in the next two weeks and next month, uh, we'll be able to make additional new hire announcements, and at the next roundtable, we'll be reporting on those to you. Uh, one area that we've had a challenge recruiting, and I'd like to um, do a little advertisement, for, uh, for positions um, is in the area of uh, managing our shop operations. We're specifically looking for uh, a person uh, who's been an insurance broker to assist us with that. And we're also looking for a manager for broker services, uh, also looking for uh, expertise um, in the health insurance industry. 
Uh, thank you. Um, next, I'd like to give you an update on, uh, on policy working groups. As you've heard earlier in, uh, in testimony from many participants in our working groups, uh, we are uh, aggressively moving forward. Our working groups are, uh, are critically important to our desire to build a DC exchange from the ground up to make sure it reflects the community's values and priorities. And I know it, it may not be the quickest uh, possible way to make policy decisions, but we, are, we at the exchange and the board of the exchange is fully committed to making sure that all stakeholders have input into our policy process. I'm pleased to report that the first working group that finished its work in January is the Essential Health Benefits Working Group. Uh, they had four, d four issues to consider, three out of the four they reached consensus on. That group was chaired by Dr. Sol Levin and Kevin Doherty. The three consensus uh, positions were, uh, were uh, adopted unanimously by the exchange board on February the 13th. The one non-consensus position involved the definition of habilitative services. Uh, there was no consensus on whether or not applied behavioral analysis, which is a treatment for autistic children, should be included in the definition. And that particular question was referred for further deliberation to one of our board's standing uh, committees. There are several working groups who are about to finish their work. And uh, a as recently as this morning, I learned uh, additional working groups are pretty close. So I'm very pleased about that. Uh, I expect that the Network Adequacy Working Group, the Premium Collection Working Group, the Plan Offerings and Benefit Standardization Working Group, as well as the Certification of Qualified Health Plans Working Group, uh, those groups will be reporting their recommendations, many of which will be consensus recommendations, to our board at our next meeting, which is March 7th. And I expect that our board will be taking a vote on those consensus positions at the following board meeting, which will be scheduled for March 14th. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have on the particular working groups after I'm done with my testimony. If you'd like additional information on the kinds of policy questions the working groups have been working through. In the next few weeks, we'll have additional policy working groups begin their work. One is on financial sustainability, one on quality, and one on standalone dental plan offerings. In addition to those policy working groups, we have IT working groups focusing on technical issues to ensure that in our IT development, we build in all the proper features that reflect our priorities and values. The four IT system working groups we have includes one on brokers to ensure that we built in specific functions to enable small businesses and individuals to access brokers through our online system. A second IT working group is the carrier working group. They had their first meeting earlier this week. We also have an IT working group on assisters and a general policy IT working groups. And all of those working groups are uh, fully engaged and will be aggressively uh, working through some of the technical issues yet to be resolved. In addition to that, uh, the executive board has approved the appointment of the members of the three advisory committees. These recommendations came from our standing advisory board, which is chaired by Chris Gardner and vice chaired by Claire McAndrew. They engaged in extensive, the advisory board engaged in extensive recruitment and review of potential candidates. Uh, and uh, these, uh, and their recommendations, I'm pleased to report, were f unanimously uh, adopted uh, in terms of appointments to these three advisory committees. So the three advisory committees include uh, broker issues, plan management issues, and the third is on consumer assistance and, and outreach. And you've heard from some of the members who testified before, before you earlier today um, about some of those groups. 
Next, I'd like to address uh, the issue that has been discussed throughout the testimony earlier, and that is the decision uh, to move to a unified marketplace where we have one big market as, oppo as opposed to multiple markets. And as a way of background, uh, I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone was aware of the fact that we currently do not have a competitive marketplace. Our marketplace is dominated by one carrier with 75% of market share of the entire market. And although some of us love that particular company, it does not make it easy for new insurance companies to come in and actively compete. Uh, and competition, of course, helps uh, make sure that premium prices offered to small businesses and individuals uh, are, uh, <coughs> um, are uh, priced well and are competitive and are affordable. The best way to create competition is to level the playing field and make it easier for, for new insurance companies and existing insurance companies to grow and compete in a fair way. Uh, through one big marketplace exchange, small businesses and individuals will have available to them all insurance options, not just some, but all, all insurance companies and all insurance products that they sell. And prices in 2014 will be more affordable if in fact there's real competition for small business and individual business. If prices for all products are displayed on one web portal where a purchaser can see all the products and all the premiums that are being offered that will force insurance companies to price their products in a very competitive way because they're going to want to earn your business. It will make it easier for small businesses to shop and to see everything that's available. If they want to use their broker, uh, there'll be every opportunity to do so. If they don't want to work with a broker, we're not going to require that. Uh, and a small business could see everything that's available in one place and easily enroll. And, um, and if a small business is currently not working with a broker, the way we are building our IT system is to enable that small business to access uh, the expert advice of an insurance broker. Also, to achieve full market competition, uh, we've decided that we're not going to do selective contracting. That is, we're not going to pick one or two insurance companies to do business with. Just the opposite. We're encouraging all insurance companies to do business through the exchange, uh, as long as they meet the minimum requirements uh, to, be, to sell a qualified health plan. In fact, through my discussions with four major insurance companies, I have commitments from all four already to sell through our exchange. We're also planning to reach out to insurance companies who want to do business through the Maryland exchange. And we want to make it easier for those companies to do business here. We've decided that we're going to use the same IT connectivity that the Maryland Exchange is using, and so that will make it easier for insurance companies to do business both through the Maryland Exchange and our exchange because they won't have two IT systems to build. Transparency is a very, very powerful tool. Uh, for the first time, with one big marketplace exchange, small businesses and individuals will be able to shop by price and quality and will have easy to understand information so they can compare apples to apples when they shop. I know that there was some discussion about limiting options 
and although final decisions have yet to be made about how many options will be displayed to a particular consumer at one time, it is certainly uh, part of our thinking that a consumer who wants to see all options available, if there are 100 options that a carrier wants to sell through the exchange, they'll be able to turn off that filter and see all options. However, if they want to um, answer a set of particular questions and have our web portal provide to them five or six good options that fit their needs, they'll be able to do that as well. I also want to mention that I think there's some confusion about some of the ACA-related changes that have to happen in 2014 and the decisions that we're making on the exchange side. It's really critical to remember that no coverage in the market today will look the same in 2014. There are new benefit requirements that uh, become effective in 2014, such as individual and, and, uh, and group coverage has to have as essential health benefits. That is not a requirement today, and so most policies will have to look different to include those essential health benefits. Uh, pricing will be different. The types of uh, premium rates that are, that are allowed today, such as uh, uh, gender-based rating and charging uh, people with medical needs higher rates, those types of uh, rating requirements uh, will change and those procedures, uh, those rating standards will no longer be allowed. Uh, so there are many, uh, many changes that will come into, uh, in, in, into uh, play in 2014, no matter what we do on the exchange side. And so knowing that, that there will be uh, uh, many significant changes in the market, it is really critical for us as we're thinking through building the exchange to to identify areas in the marketplace that really work well now and not to lose them. And also to mitigate any additional um, unintended consequences as a result of many, many changes in the, in the way private, the private market works and, and functions. So to that end, uh, we made an early decision that it's critically important for us to build in brokers into the exchange in a very significant way, to build in uh, third-party administrators and big administrators that currently provide a lot of back office support for brokers, and also to build in uh, the wholesalers who currently provide back office support for brokers. So at the front end, many consumers should not see uh, too many changes at the back end will ensure that those changes go as smoothly and are implemented as smoothly as, as possible. I also want to remind you that uh, if health insurance currently is grandfathered, that is, if you've had the coverage in March of 2010 and you haven't had significant changes to that coverage, it is likely that your coverage is grandfathered. And so most of the ACA-related standards are not going to change your coverage. And what we do on the exchange part and what we do with the decision to have one big marketplace also will not impact grandfathered coverage. And I just wanted to make sure um, that it, that I set the record straight because I think uh, there may have been some confusion with some of the testimony you heard earlier. I also want to talk about the transition. The transition to one big marketplace is, is critical, a well-thought-out transition that works for uh, for all stakeholders that are providing insurance now, are buying insurance now, and providing services. To that end, I have asked our standing advisory board to advise me on what a one or two year transition should look like. 
Earlier this week, the advisory board made its final decisions, and I expect to get their final formal report today. I've seen drafts of, of, of an earlier version, and I can tell you um, they, the advisory board's recommendation to me um, is that for the individual market, we shouldn't have any transition, meaning that all individuals should go to the big marketplace exchange to get their coverage. On the small group side, the advisory board has recommended to me a two-year transition. Uh, and so some of those details uh, I'll be uh, reporting on to, to the uh, board of the exchange at the next uh, meeting, which is March 7th. And um, I hope that uh, at the following meeting of March 14th, we'll have a vote on what a transition to, uh, to one big marketplace exchange should look like here. And that will be part of our legislative package, which will include uh, many of the other decisions our board will be making that's based on the consensus recommendations from our various policy working groups. Uh, because the working groups are still uh, working through some of those issues, uh, we're not able to have our legislative package ready um, early in March as I had hoped. But I think it's really critical to give those working groups time to deliberate these very complicated issues so, um, so we truly can say that our exchange was built from the ground up. I am, I am putting pressure on them to work quickly. <laughs> And I do hope what, that... What, what's a reasonable time when the legislative package will be ready? I'm putting a lot of pressure on those working groups to, to, to finish their work. Um, I end hope that March. end of March, early, early April, uh, we would have a good sense of, 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 of the uh, various details. Okay. Let's make it April 2nd, not April 1st. Okay. <laughs> <Just> okay. okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, I want to say a couple of things about uh, the importance of working with, uh, uh, with our community on outreach. And um, I, I'm so thrilled to report that our outreach efforts to date um, have been vigorous and, um, and we've been very active. You heard a little bit uh, about our big summit that we held uh, at Mount Vernon Place Conference Center. We had over 300 people attend, and it was a, a great success, and uh, certainly appreciate um, all of the work of our sister agencies uh, and participation of sister agencies to helping that happen. In the coming weeks and months, we will continue those efforts, um, and we will be developing a comprehensive plan to conduct outreach, education, and marketing of the exchange and its benefits. And that work will include detailed market research to help us understand our target audience, to develop our name brand and logo, to communicate our mission and purpose. Uh, we'll be creating, creating materials and brochures to share with our uh, partners in this, uh, to help educate district businesses and residents about the Affordable Care Act and about the exchange and the coverage that we'll have during open enrollment in the fall. And we'll be using uh, many diverse uh, uh, ways to communicate, including uh, uh, a marketing campaign that will take advantage of uh, very diverse uh, opportunities like uh, uh, television, radio, uh, uh, the metro system, and others. I do want to mention to you that both Dr. Actor and myself and some of the other board members have been very active in talking with community groups all around the city. Uh, uh, recently, we, we spoke to the, the D.C. Chamber of Commerce, the nonprofit roundtable, uh, the Philippine American Metro Chamber of Commerce, and in attendance was the Chinese American Chamber of Commerce for D.C. We had various events around the city, and we look forward to doing more of those events 
uh, to, to help educate uh, the district residents and businesses about the Affordable Care Act. I will not uh, say too much about our IT uh, in my full written testimony. You'll see a full progress report. I will just say that uh, on the IT front, um, I'm very pleased at the pace that we're moving with the help of a nationally recognized um, expert that's uh, our consultant on this uh, and with a full um, uh, interagency uh, leadership team. Uh, and some of the steps that Infosys has taken, uh, we're moving forward and aggressively to meet all of the requirements and all of the testing uh, for full implementation to be ready uh, for the fall enrollment. I would just like to close by saying I truly appreciate all the, uh, all the work that all of our sister agencies uh, have been doing. Uh, including DHS, uh, Healthcare Finance, DOH, and DISBE. And uh, I would like to thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership in, in, in making sure that um, we are uh, aggressively going forward to implement the best possible exchange for the district. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony and for the updates. It's a pleasure to meet. Uh, the staff that you have hired thus far. Uh, I was wondering, and I'm going to go through, I guess, the three major um, concerns would be the communication, the outreach. Uh, we went over the small market, um, again, the market base for the exchange and also the um, stakeholder groups. So first off, in terms of the public outreach and the communications, and I heard the forum went well through testimony over 300 attendees. Um, and we had two members of our faith-based faith community there. Are you going to engage churches and, well, I guess places of worship in your outreach efforts? And what role will they play? Yes. Uh, we, yes, yes, and yes. Um, we, uh, we have to have full partners. Um, with uh, diverse, uh, uh, trusted uh, people in the community. Or, or just wondering, is there going to be any consideration for a communications director in terms of um, the staff that you're going to hire? Would, would that be, I mean, would that be a decision that you're going to make with such the broad range of communications goals that you have to reach and outreach? Yes, uh, once our director of communications um, is on board, uh, that person will be helping us with our full outreach strategy. In addition to that, we have an advisory committee uh, for outreach and um, assisters, and we'll be utilizing their advice uh, to help us with our communication strategy in engaging all of our partners fully relying on the inclusion of the faith-based community as well as other partners like community health centers and other and um, and the chamber the DC chamber and other um, small business associations to help us with our strategy we are requesting additional funding uh, for outreach from the federal government we anticipate uh, requesting about 10 million dollars in additional funding uh, solely focused uh, to providing uh, that funding to community-based organizations uh, to help with outreach and ultimately to help with enrollment. We used a working group to help advise us on that budget. The working group included uh, Barbara Lang from the Chamber and, and other uh, 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 stakeholders to help us figure <coughs> out what kind of budget we may need for the sisters. And, and in addition to the outreach effort, the communications piece, um, I guess like a fact sheet that can give all the, um, the points about you know, how you can benefit from the exchange. As Dr. Um, Okta mentioned about if you're underinsured, if you're paying too much money um, for your premium, if you don't have insurance, you know, uh, something that, you know, could pass out a, a one sheet, fact sheet. And I think a communications expert would be, I guess would be the ones, or a health educator, whoever, that would know what to say to attract 
um, residents to say this could benefit me. So in addition to the outreach effort, a communications expert to know how to bring that um, information across to average Joe Blow citizen. We also met with average the average Joe citizen, yeah. not Joe Blow. We also met with the agency PIOs because they can be very helpful in reaching their constituency. For example, DMV people could have the information available while people are waiting there that they could go through the information, could do that. And there was a lot of interest, so we were working with the mayor's office and the PIOs, uh, public information officers in each of the agencies to be our partners in, in spreading the world in addition to going to community-based organizations, churches, and other stakeholders. And I would just like to add through, uh, and we've started our market research effort already. That will help us uh, define fully our target audience so we can be very specific and very targeted in our message. Um, and that will help us understand their information needs and habits and capacities and will inform us in a very strategic way how we reach people who are without insurance and people who are underinsured as well as generally uh, the workforce um, and businesses and individuals here. And part of that effort will also inform uh, how we can produce materials that are uh, uh, culturally sensitive and lingu linguistically appropriate for different populations. So we fully intend to produce uh, specific targeted fact sheets that work for a particular population that we're trying to target and our sisters and other folks we partner with will be able to use that uh, literature that we produce in their efforts. <laughs> we want to be specific um, and I'm going to ask about other because I know a CFO we were still um, we were still waiting for a CFO to be hired, but when will these, when will the final um, hires take place? When will, if a communications director or CFO, do you have a drop dead date? Um, I hope to make announcements about our communications director in the next week or so. Um, and um, the, the financial positions are uh, to be hired uh, by a different office. Uh, those are not the positions that we post and hire. Yeah. Uh, we met with Mr. Gandhi because it's his office that will assign a CFO. Mm -hmm. And he's promised us that within a week he will have the, um, the individual for I'll us follow to consider. Up as well. <laughs> thank you very kindly. We appreciate that. Thank you. Now on to the working groups, and thank you um, for your report on the working groups. I understand there are some groups that have not met yet. and. Why is that happening? Um, when do they plan to meet? And there's only been a specific um, plan of action, I think, from the benefits working group. So you say because we, we want to get any legislative recommendations, we want to get those um, to my office. So I need to know when are these groups going to meet because I'm sure it's going to take a while for them to work through some of their issues and come up with some decisions, so. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the opportunity to clarify uh, the way we established our priorities for these working groups. Uh, we needed the I, uh, working groups that will impact IT decisions to meet early on, and we also needed working groups that impact the kinds of products that are going to be offered to meet very early. We also needed uh, the working groups uh, that uh, may impact uh, whether or not we need legislation uh, to also meet early. So we prioritize the, the policy questions in the working groups based on our IT needs and, and the fact that we may need um, to include those decisions in legislation. Uh, there are some things that we uh, may not need legislation for, so those working groups are meeting a little bit later. And also, um, there are some things that will, will not impact the kinds of products that are being offered. And so those working groups can meet later as well. And I'll give you a specific example. Uh, a quality working group um, is going to start meeting in March. 
we felt it wasn't necessary for them to meet early on because those decisions could be implemented over time and we don't necessarily need uh, their decisions um, uh, to, uh, to inform IT issues or legislation. And um, with regards to some of the non-consensus issues, are there some issues that are really, um, really pressing that there's not a consensus on at this time? And what are those issues? Uh, so uh, I have asked uh, a committee of the board uh, to, uh, to essentially wait until they receive all of the non-consensus uh, referrals so they can make a decision weighing um, all factors, doing a cost-benefit analysis, um, and having a holistic view. Uh, so so to, ultimately, to the board will discuss those issues? Correct. That's correct. We have a, a, a committee of the board uh, with several board members who will look at the, the work of the working groups, uh, the record, uh, the uh, data, the research, the decisions, the arguments that were made before the working groups, and weigh those factors and then make recommendations to the full board. So in addition to the working group, um, in addition to their recommendations, if I could get the list of the non-consensus issues and what the board has come up with too. Uh, yes, so to date there's, there's only one non-consensus issue that has been referred to the board's committee and that is on the definition of habilitative services, whether to include treatment for autistic children in that definition and whether to include um, the term maintenance in the definition that was being proposed. Uh, I expect to receive additional reports from the working groups uh, uh, as early as tomorrow and, and probably most, most of them early next week uh, for, for full presentation to the board at our March 7th meeting. And so we'll, we'll know uh, all of the consensus recommendations and all of the non-consensus recommendations at that time. And I will update your office on the non-consensus uh, policy questions that we'll be referring to the committee of the board. And one thing that's come out of the working groups, I guess, is the transition period, because I've heard that mm -hmm. in everyone's testimony. Was the decision and how was that reached um, for a two-year transition period? Is that across the board agreeable with everyone? Uh, um, so the advisory uh, standing uh, uh, board um, uh, debated significantly and, and received some public input into their deliberations. Uh, on, the, on the transition question for the individual market, it was unanimous. Uh, that there should not be a transition. On the small group side, um, there was a majority position and um, a minority position in terms of what's appropriate for businesses who currently do not offer coverage, whether those businesses should go into uh, uh, the, the marketplace exchange or if, if there should be a transition of two years for those businesses as well as businesses who currently have coverage. Um, so there's a minority and a majority report uh, that will be uh, formally transmitted to me today. Uh, based on those recommendations, I will be uh, not only looking at, the, at their final report, the advisory uh, board's final report, but I'll also be looking at um, some of the testimony that was presented to them by stakeholders uh, to doing a full review, and I will be presenting my recommendations to the exchange board on March 7th. What would be the rationale for offering the same plan outside of the exchange as well as inside of the exchange. What, what's the rationale? Why would outside carriers be required to, to meet the requirements of the Affordable Care Act? Uh, the advisory board uh, did recommend um, to, have the the, uh, to have the same standards. They considered many reasons for doing so, uh, one of which um, is it, it helps to address any kind of gaming that may be happening with, with some carriers trying to attract um, better risks. Um, it also helps. Uh, helps to transition to a, a big marketplace exchange uh, in a very smooth way. 
Uh, the one thing I forgot to mention to you is that we went back and we tried to take a look at the administrative costs uh, currently in our marketplace looking at the individual uh, business, the small group business and the large group business. Uh, and we also looked at those loads uh, for Virginia and Maryland. And um, in a nutshell, I can tell you one large carrier uh, charges $79 per member per month for uh, just for on the administrative cost of the premium. Not any medical expenses, but just the administrative load. Uh, $79 per member per month for the individual side. Uh, $54 administrative load on the small group side and $26 for large groups. So currently small businesses pay a lot higher administrative costs than large groups do. Uh, I believe that having one big marketplace will substantially save on administrative costs. Essentially small businesses will be will have the purchasing power of large employers uh, and will be able to achieve some administrative cost savings and just to give you a sense of how that compares to the same carriers coverage in Virginia and Maryland whereas uh, in the, uh, the administrative load in DC for individuals is $79 per member per month in Virginia that's uh, that carrier uh, charges only forty six dollars, and in Maryland um, that goes down to thirty nine dollars, uh, and uh, similar uh, facts are true for the lar for the small group and large group markets as well. So today in the district, um, our individual uh, purchasers and our small businesses are charged higher administrative costs. For the, for the same coverage or similar coverage um, that is sold uh, uh, in Maryland and in Virginia. So one, one um, big goal of having one marketplace exchange, a big exchange uh, to sell coverage through is to help address that disparity and lower the administrative cost loads that are built into the district's premiums. So they could be lowered through the exchange. Absolutely. And how can we ensure the same, well, <clears throat> through administrative costs is one thing. How can we ensure that the benefits, a lot of businesses have testified today that they believe they can get more options outside. Um, so we would, I guess we would have to have considerable options for the companies within the exchange. and. How are we going to make that determination to have 12 different, you know, offerings per company or four different offerings or how are we going to do that? People think they have more selection outside than they would in. So when is that determination going to be made? So if carriers want to sell a hundred or a thousand products, they're welcome to sell those products through our marketplace exchange. The IT uh, portal that we're, the web portal that we're building will have filters. So shoppers can uh, put in information about their needs and their priorities and have um, our, our web portal give them five or ten options to look at. If they want to turn off those filters, they can see the hundreds of products that carriers offer. So if, if insurance companies want to offer tons of products, um, they, they can offer them through the exchange. The end user will have the option of seeing all the products being offered or some set of products. And for insurance brokers, it will be a whole lot easier to have one portal to look at all of the options as they work with small business owners as opposed to today where in many cases you actually have to price the business going uh, uh, for, uh, for information and, and um, uh, premium loads, uh, uh, the prices and the benefits to different carriers so that takes time. So I believe that having one portal um, uh, that uh, brokers could use will save them time and that will help them offer potentially better options to their small business clients. So if there is a mandate of a closed market and you said the, the businesses who 
were insured since 2010 will be exempt from being a member of the pool? That's correct. How would that, I don't understand how that would would affect them. How would they be able to keep the same the same price after, you know, after 2014? So uh, grandfathered coverage under the Affordable Care Act is, um, is coverage that you as an individual or you as a small business had in March of 2010. And if you haven't made substantial changes uh, to that coverage as a small business, you're likely to be grandfathered. And most of the Affordable Care Act standards, new consumer protections and benefits, they do not apply to grandfathered plans. Nothing that we do with the exchange products, the, the new products that are being offered, uh, will impact grandfathered plans. Now, insurance companies uh, can decide they no longer want to offer those, but that is a business decision that an insurance company makes, and um, insurance companies make decisions um, about what products to offer all the time, and, and you've probably heard about closed blocks. You used to have a, a certain policy, but it's no longer being offered because uh, of, of business uh, reasons. Um, but that is a decision that insurance companies will be making, not us. So nothing that we do with the way our marketplace works, whether um, it's one big marketplace exchange or something other than that, will impact grandfathered plans. <laughs> and like I said, the, the one big marketplace exchange um, will enable users, will enable purchasers to see all the products, all the prices, and make very knowledgeable apples to apples decisions about what fits their needs. And if they, and if a user wants to see all of the products being sold, and insurance companies want to sell a bunch of hundreds of products, uh, the user will be able to turn off the filter and see everything that's available. So when will be the next demonstration for the board for um, the IT system? Is there a plan for a trial run? I'm interested because I'd like to attend. <laughs> uh, when we schedule that, we will let you know in advance so you, so you know it's been scheduled. Will it be coming up next month, you think, in March, sometime in March or April? When Maybe early April, you know. So the first meeting in April. Okay, so in early April, follow up with me, and then the legislative recommendations should be early April. Yes. Um, the working group's recommendations should be early April, and the hiring of the um, financial um, person and the communications director should be in a couple of weeks. In a couple of weeks. I don't have any further updates. Um, yes. Uh, Madam Chair, um, we're undergoing our SOSIO um, testing in, in mid-April, and so um, we probably are likely, <coughs> likely to have a demonstration after that. Okay. Um, uh, just so we can focus all of our resources on the IT side to passing the SOSIO test. Thank you, and I don't have any further um, procurement questions or performance questions. Uh, the sure. Department of Human Services answered those adequately. So I don't have any further questions. I do appreciate you all coming to testify and giving us a monthly update on the um, success of the exchange. I thank you for all your hard work. I thank all of those who came to testify. Um, this concludes today's Public Oversight Roundtable on the Implementation of the District of Columbia Health Benefit Exchange Authority. Uh, as a reminder, this matter will close on Thursday, March the 14th. If anyone would like to submit any other written statements, they are to do so on or before 5 p.m. on Thursday, March the 14th. The time is 3.43 p.m. and we are adjourned. Thank you.